Welcome to Just a Minute. My name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away once more, it is my pleasure to welcome not only our loyal and faithful listeners throughout the world, but also our loyal and faithful performers of this game who have joined us this week to participate. We welcome back four of the outstanding players of the game, the delightful Paul Merton, the equally entertaining and... uh, spontaneous Tony Hawks, and two different generation of comedy performers, a wonderful actor, performer, and comedy player, Peter Jones, and also a great humorous wit and raconteur, Clement Freud. Would you please welcome all four of them? And, as usual, I am going to ask them to speak on the subject that I will give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviating from that subject. Beside me sits Jane Gibson, who is going to help me keep the score. She has a stopwatch here, which she will hold for me, and she will blow a whistle when the 60 seconds are up. And this particular edition of Just a Minute is coming from the BBC Radio Theatre in the Central Broadcasting House, which is in the heart of our great capital city of London. Uh, Paul Merton, will you begin the show this week? The subject is... The Secret Mission. Tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now. Many years ago, I was given a secret mission by the British government. I had to make my way to Prague in Czechoslovakia, hide underneath a shoebox for several days, and make contact with a gentleman that I knew only as Donald. (laughs) He approached me one late afternoon. The rain was streaming down the window as I looked out, because I'd put a window in the shoebox, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I was going to say window and shoebox, I was bored. You were bored, <laughs> you're right. But, but Tony Hawks, you challenged first. Uh, repetition of window. He repeated the word window, and he was, he was bored, so he threw in a, a repetition. And uh, you have a correct challenge, you get a point for that, of course, Tony. You take over the subject which is The Secret Mission. 35 seconds are available starting now. They have a lot of secret missions in Mission Impossible, and they always say, your mission should you choose to accept. And they never refuse it. I want them to say I... Uh, Paul Merton challenge. He refuses loads of them, but they wouldn't make very good television programmes. <laughs> Man walks into a phone box, listens to a tape recorder, decides not to do the job. There's not an hour's worth of television in that. <laughs> They only show you the ones that they do, because otherwise it'd be a waste of time. Well, that's my minute gone. I was what I was going to bloody talk about. (laughs) (laughs) I don't think that was uh, strictly deviating within the rules of just a minute. So, Paul, I can't agree with the challenge, so, uh, Tony, you have another point, another... um, And you'll carry on with the subject. 24 seconds available, starting now. I have a secret mission tonight which I can't tell you about, because if I did, it wouldn't be a secret. And technically, I would be deviating from the subject. And, Lordy, that's the last thing I want to do. (laughs) Instead... Uh, Clement Freud challenged. Tell us what the first thing you'd want to do. (laughs) Well, it would be to... uh, Well, I don't think you need (laughs) answer. I'd like to know what is your challenge within the rules of just a minute, uh, Clement. I just wanted to say good evening. Mm. (laughs) Well, you said it very nicely. You've got a nice reaction, but I'm afraid it was an incorrect (laughs) challenge. So, Tony, more points to you. Another one. Secret mission still with you, and nine seconds available starting now. David and I walked up the steps to MFI's offices. I don't know why. (laughs) (laughs) Poor Martin (laughs) Charles. Buying furniture, were you? No, I, I think I must give the benefit of the doubt to Paul Merton here. Say, Paul, yes, a correct challenge. A point to you. Four seconds. Uh, the secret mission starting now. There's a man in the audience from Sweden whose secret mission is to rub out Nicholas Parsons. <laughs> Whoever is speaking when the whistle is blown gains an extra point for doing so on this occasion. It was Paul Merton. So at the end of that round, he has got two points. Peter, we've yet to hear from you, so why not take the next round? It's a charming one. Jabberwocky. 60 seconds starting now. Yes, Lewis Carroll has always been anathema to me. I think (laughs) he's a terribly boring writer. He was quite interested in punting with young girls and telling them stories, very innocently, I'm sure. But they were so boring, I thought, when I was seven and learning to read, that if this is what uh, waits me, then I don't really want to go on with it. (laughs) But... uh, (laughs) 
<laughs> Paul Mertensjanus. Hesitation. Paul. I think there was definitely yes, was hesitation. Was. Yes, oh, yes. Oh. 33 seconds available. Jabberwocky, starting now. Jabberwocky, or as they say in Australia, Wobber Jockey, is a rider of a horse that you can't trust that's going to do the best job for the stable. This is... <laughs> 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 it's just some people trust in every word I say. <laughs> Tony, you challenged first. Well, he just broke into uh, yes, laughter, it, didn't he? Yes. You can't, and he repeated, huh. <laughs> <laughs> we interpret that as hesitation. Right, Tony, another point to you. 23 seconds, Jabberwocky starting now. Jabberwocky was the first film directed by Terry Gilliam. That, uh, uh, Paul Merton challenged. No, it wasn't. On Thursday the 26th <laughs> of February, 1971. And you were there, were you? Well, that's what I was going to go on to say. Funny, that was a Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> deviation. That was a correct challenge of deviation, so, Paul, another point to you. 18 seconds, Jabberwocky, starting now. I suppose whenever I hear the word Jabberwocky, I'm immediately taken back to those wonderful, halcyon childhood days when me and Prince Philip used to travel down towards Cambridge, the dream inspires of that beautiful city. The city where... It's not even as... Oh. Mm. Clement Roy Towns. <laughs> Repetition of city. The city, yes. And Clement, it's not even you, a city. Clement, you cleverly got him with one second to go. <clears throat> point for a correct challenge. Jabberwocky starting now. It was brilliant. <laughs> Well, Clement Freud was then speaking as the whistle went, gained that extra point for doing so, and he is now in second place behind our joint leaders, Paul Merton and Tony Hawkes. And Clement Freud, it's your turn to begin. The subject is the West End, 60 seconds as usual, starting now. I suppose every city and town, even villages and hamlets, have West Ends. I have personally been to the West End of Perth, Sydney, Melbourne and Adelaide, and leaving the Australian continent, the West End of England... London, especially Mayfair, which is known as the West End by those who dwell in the metropolis of England. Um, Tony Hawk's challenge. Uh, repetition of England. Yes, that's right, yes. 34 seconds for you, Tony, on the West End, starting now. We are making this recording in the wonderful radio theatre, not miles away from the centre of the West End in London, and after the show, no doubt, the five of us here will go out and drink into the night, as we do after every other occasion when we've done this. Some put pints away like nobody's business, others decide they want to go to Soho, I don't go along with that myself, I'd rather see the theatre or some such thing. It really is the entertainment capital of the world, if you like. New York could be a rival, but I don't think it touches the West End as we know it. I've been to the West End in Huddersfield. <laughs> So, Tony Hawkes is excelling this week. More, more great style and panache. He went to the whistle when, gained that extra point for doing so, and has increased his lead at the end of the round. And, Tony, your turn to begin. The subject is contortionist. Tell us something about that in this game, starting now. Someone told me if you want to be a contortionist, it helps if you're double-jointed, because you can smoke both the joints, and then you don't feel any pain as you move your body into a different position. I'm able to put my left leg behind my right ear, but it is excruciatingly painful because amputation is involved. <laughs> a contortionist is a gymnast or such like who moves parts of his magnificent physique into these extraordinary places, but you could be a wordsmith who twisted things like we do on just a minute. Many times we have to talk for 50 seconds, sometimes longer, a minute in my case, which is clearly what I'm going to do here, because no one... <laughs> <laughs> Paul Merton challenge. No, he isn't. <laughs> <laughs> so... Deviation. He's deviated from contortionists and now talking about playing just a minute. Exactly. You don't need to be a contortionist oh, For to about 0.1 of a second. So, Paul, I agree with the challenge. 17 seconds with you. Contortionists starting now. My next-door neighbour is a contortionist and he likes nothing better than looking up old friends round about the Christmas holiday. Because when you are a contortionist, you can get yourself into all kinds of strange positions. <laughs> in fact, that's what I meant the first time round, but nobody laughs, so I can't really repeat it. But so you're getting the idea if I go over the subject matter using different... Uh, <laughs> Tony Hawk's the challenge just as the whistle was he, about to go. Well, he's talking about just a minute and how he's not allowed to repeat things within the game. Um, he's exactly. doing exactly what I did. You've been, you've been hoisted on your own yeah. petard, uh, Paul, so... Tony. Have I? Yes. <laughs> Within the, uh, just a minute, and uh, Tony Hawkes has got the subject back. He's got a second to tell us more about contortionists starting now. Lulu once. So, Tony Hawkes speaking as a Repetition of Lou. <laughs> <laughs> Who 
late now. The rest too late now. And uh, Tony, you were speaking as the whistle went. In that extra point, you're one ahead of Paul Merton and two ahead of Peter Jones and four ahead of Clement Freud. That is the situation. We move into the next round, which is Paul Merton's turn to begin. Oh, Paul, what are you going to say about this, I wonder? The rudest person I ever met. Oh, they're giggling already. 60 seconds, starting now. Well, people like me generally, so they aren't particularly rude to me. I suppose we do find rudeness. Some people say that cab drivers are... Uh, Tony Hawk says... Uh, repetition of people. Yes, I'm afraid there were more people. Mm. Came in more than once. So, Tony, well, listen, you've got in with 52 seconds still. The rudest person I ever met starting now. The rudest person I ever met was Fidel Castro. We were at a party in Cuba, and I was having a marvellous evening, and I went... (laughs) (laughs) Went. Went, yes. Going into the Spanish pronunciation. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Deviation from the English as we understand it, and uh, Paul, you've got in with 42 seconds on the rudest person I ever met starting now. Sometimes security people outside buildings. <laughs> Tony Hawk's charge. Uh, repetition of people again. <laughs> <laughs> Well, listen, Tony, another point to you. Subject back with you, 38 seconds. The rudest person I ever met starting now. Lou Ditto, that fine singer, (laughs) was extraordinarily rude to me after Top of the Pops, because I've been on that programme, actually, but we won't go into now, because that would be deviating. But all I ask... Uh, Peter Jones, a challenge. Why did you bring it up? (laughs) 27 seconds for you to tell us now something about the rudest person I ever met starting now. Well, I met Castro several times, and he was awfully nice to me, I must say, (laughs) particularly at parties in uh, Cuba, where they drank a lot of Bacardi rum and danced, and uh, I joined in. And he was an extraordinary man in a way, because I don't know whether you know about him. Virginia Hawks Challenge. So who was the rudest person you ever met? (laughs) You're I was talking about how charming about, he was. Uh, Fidel's brother. <laughs> Nine <laughs> seconds for you, Tony. Correct challenge. The rudest person I ever met, starting now. I was on a pirate ship in the Atlantic Ocean, the Jolly Roger flag up on the mask, and the bosun called down to me, said, Oi! Uh, put him at Freud challenge. He's nowhere near the rudest person. No, I mean, no, 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 he was up the there. The was about to cool down. I was just setting the scene. Clement, I agree with the challenge. One second delay available still. The rudest person I ever met starting now. Rude Gullit. <laughs> so Clement Freud, speaking as the whistle went, has moved forward. He's still training a little for once. Out in the lead is Tony Hawks and Peter Jones. It's your turn to begin. Feng Shu. Would you tell us something about that in this game, starting now? That isn't even English. (laughs) No. Why do they bring it to the worst linguist on the team? (laughs) It doesn't seem reasonable to me. Well, you give it, as 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 a Chinese linguist, give me the correct pronunciation. I can't pronounce it. I'm not a linguist, certainly not a Chinese one. Does any any Chinese linguist in the audience, please, we need some help here? Feng Shui. Feng Shui? (laughs) Feng Shui. All right, shall, shall we go... Well, it's that tune, isn't it? <laughs> Feng Shui. Get him for nothing, start using language like that. <laughs> Peter, the subject Feng Shui or Feng Shui or whichever way you want to take it, it's up to you. Your pronunciation will be accepted. 60 seconds on this subject starting now. It sounds vaguely like 167 in the menu of the Chinese garden in Finchley Road. <laughs> Now, I don't know whether it is or not, or whether it's a food or a musical instrument. <laughs> or it's can... Paul Merton has challenged you. He's helped you out. Deviation, Paul. it's both. It's... <laughs> but it is food and a musical instrument. Is well, it? There's all kinds of possibilities. No, it's mm. hesitation. But it was hesitation. And 45 seconds for you to tell us something about this subject, starting now. Huang Shui is <laughs> one of the tidiest of all the Chinese arts. Unlike Kung Fu, it's much neater. It doesn't involve people getting hit very hard. It's a belief that you have to put places like mirrors in a very secure part of the house where it reflects golden light and well... Uh, Tony Hawk's a challenge. I put it to you that a mirror isn't a place. <laughs> it's an object. Are you, you not you're actually listening to what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> you're not taking notes, are you? <laughs> you're wasting your time. <laughs> You'll be surprised how many people take notes and write into me about it. Uh, but, how uh, many? Well. <laughs> Shall I tell you now, Nicholas? It's mm. been me over all these years. Right? <laughs> yeah. But your letters I just were. I a bit of funny writing at the bottom. Wing hung suck at the bottom. Yes. <laughs> Peking. 
Peking High Street. Big fan of Rickless Rasons. I'll write that. <laughs> no, no, it's me. It's me. Um, uh, Tony. Correct challenge. You have a point, and you have 25 seconds to tell us something about Feng Shu, Feng Shui, whichever way you wish to take it. 25 seconds starting now. Take a mirror and place it in a fantastic spot, and your life could change. Such is the Chinese art of Feng Shui, which tells you that placement is everything to get the energies in your house flowing correctly. If you have the wrong kind of energy, then you will attract bad luck, and heaven knows we don't want that. Peter Jones a challenge. It sounded as though he said energy twice. No, he said energies and energy. You got that, did you? I got that. <laughs> One of the jobs I'm paid for is to listen, and if I don't, I get absolutely castigated by the other members of the team, you see. I see. Yes. And, uh, castigated? He did. <laughs> well, yes. It's a harsh punishment. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm sorry, Peter, an incorrect challenge. One second available with you, Tony, starting now. Many people have asked me where... <laughs> Um, oh, what happened then? Uh, well, Tony Hawks is obviously speaking of the whistle went, and uh, he's moved into a commanding lead at the end of that run. Paul, it's your turn to begin. And the subject here, oh, this sounds a good one, what I keep under my mattress. Tell us something about it in just a minute, starting now. I keep under my mattress at home a life-size blow-up model of Nicholas Parsons, <laughs> complete with functioning organs. We have a Wednesday get-together with the neighbours where I get out the foot pump and we stand around this little bit of plastic lying on the living room floor and I slowly, up and down with my foot, I press air into this enormously lifeless form and suddenly you see a whiff of a sports jacket. You see, could it be that we are going to have amongst us now a, a replica of that great man who has entertained us now for what seems like a quarter of an hour in his <laughs> wonderful career and as the form is filled with oxygen, the surrounding guests, they gasp, they reach for twiglets, drink sherry and there is a fully function and chairman of just a minute there in front of them. What do we do? Well, some people call it satanic, some people call it evil, but what we like to do is we get hold of this figurine. Oh, so Paul Merton started with the subject and kept going for the full 60 seconds without being interrupted, so he gets a po point for speaking when the whistle went. I'm Clement Freud, your turn to begin. The subject for this round is the final demand. Tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now. The final demand tends to come in a brown envelope with a window, and you open it, and the letter that comes from this covering begins, Dear Sir, Unless... And the title is right, but the name is totally wrong. Um, thank you. Peter Jones' challenge. That was the all final I demand is usually... No, I haven't said... I haven't said <laughs> what was the challenge? Hesitation. It was hesitation, and I agree with it. I would have thought that was fairly obvious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Peter, I agree with the challenge, yes? Hesitation, you have the subject, and you have 40 seconds starting now. Well, the final demand is usually uttered by the grim reaper himself, who says, follow me. Now, when he says this uh, to myself, then I shall probably decline the invitation because I <laughs> don't want to go into the next world, as he would no doubt have me do, because I don't believe it's going to be a great deal better than the one I'm living in now. <laughs> so I shan't agree to the final demand, and he may easily get the sack. Uh, because he's obviously been put up to this by some higher authority, and I doubt if uh, he would be able to survive disobedience of that kind on any scale at all. This is... Uh... <laughs> actually, we, we accidentally let it run past the minute, because... Uh... You did? Yes, I know. That's why I buzzed. buzzed. We, and before the buzzer went. No, I buzzed because he was running over the minute. <laughs> And uh, Jane accidentally didn't pick up her whistle on time, and she, she let it go for two or three seconds over. Ah. And then when Clement challenged, you'd already... 60 seconds was up. You, you're not really bothered, are you? I mean, I know well, the listeners couldn't care less. We can get sleep. the law lords in on this one. <laughs> <laughs> you, 
And we're moving into the final round, for those who are interested in the points of the scoring. And um, it is Tony Hawks. We're back with you, Tony. Will you take the final round, which is going to be liaisons? Tell us something about that in 60 seconds, starting now. I very much enjoyed the play Les Liaisons Dangereux, which was on in the West End of London for some time, and I suppose there are... Me- uh, Paul Merton Chant. Deviation is pronounced Feng Shui. <laughs> <laughs> Um, So, well done, Tony. I enjoyed the challenge. I didn't know what it meant. And, um, Tony, an incorrect challenge. Liaisons dangereuses. Quand je t'ai oublié, se faire en éplouard, on comprend oui, maintenant, en 53 minutes, 50. Commençons maintenant. Oh, Répétition. Of a pause. All yeah. right, Paul, you have the subject. You have 48 seconds. <laughs> liaisons starting now. What's the subject? Liaisons. Oh, well, I remember. Uh, Tony Challenge. Il ne parle pas le français, hein? <laughs> Et il faut continuer en français, hein? Qu'est-ce que tu vas? So no, we're going to... It's wasted continue. on me. I did metal work. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> wasted on me. <laughs> Yeah. It's true. So, if you want to continue in French, you have 46 seconds, Tony. Liaisons. Uh, why, is, why, is he get, why has he got it? I uh, don't know. I just thought it was good fun. I mean, the whole thing's gone to pieces. <laughs> he wanted to go he on. He buzzes, a... talks, make, in some, talks in some gibberish made up language. No, it wasn't actually. It made sense. Uh, what did he say then? He said, uh, You've got to speak in French. This is the idea. I speak in English now, so it's all gone to pot. <laughs> um, I speak think it's in English. French. <laughs> yes. You've given him the subject because I wasn't speaking in French. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've got to carry on in French, otherwise I'm out. It's like a party game. It's a party so, game. It's <laughs> repetition, deviation, hesitation, and not speaking in French. <laughs> well, <laughs> you can speak in metal work. You yes. can speak in metal work, all right. All right. <laughs> this French speaking rule, I've missed it over the last few yeah, right. years. Right. 46 seconds for you to do metalwork uh, French, starting now. J'étais avec... No, him! Ca- <laughs> I thought I won that challenge. No, no, no. no you, it, you, it, I, I want the law lords and I want them here now. <laughs> and I want all their interests declared uh, as well. Paul has a chance to show off his metalwork uh, as he takes the subject. And, uh, and you have 40 seconds. Is he going to take his teeth out? <laughs> 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 no, that's bridge work. <laughs> this is descending into anarchy. I know. If, if you're Chinese, don't write in. It's not. <laughs> I love to finish a show on a little bit of anarchy because the audience enjoy it. And it's, it's metal work, or liaisons. I don't know the French for metal work. No, it's I not can't... you. He's, he's going to do metal work. You're doing French. Well, uh, they all have to take it their uh, own way. Okay. This is the new concept for this particular round uh, of Paul Merton uh, metal work um, version of Liaisons starting now. I remember the sat film. It was very good. Two blacksmiths meet across the room and they've got little fans and they don't know which one's in charge of the pig iron or not. And one of them's making a little trowel in the foundry and the other person is there and they're wondering whether they're going to fall for this dark, elegant man with huge muscles who are making horseshoes every day. You see, that's metal work. They taught me that subject at uh, school. And- Clement Floyd challenge. Repetition of metal work. Yes, that's metal work. It's not on the card. It's liaison. But I thought that was the subject, metal work. No, no, it's liaison. Well, I was to repeat the subject. You had you to told spe- me the subject was metal work. No, metal work speak you had to give us on the subject of liaisons. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> It means whatever you want. That's the joy of this round. Oh, right, OK. Right. Just, just out of a matter of interest, what is the French for metal work? Uh, the work. Oh, OK. No, <laughs> no, no, le solide oeuvre. Ah, OK, fine. That's egg, isn't it? <laughs> That's oeuvre. Oh, right. I just need to know in case... Anybody else want to get in the French lesson? Uh, yeah. right. <laughs> Clement Freud, you have 20 I didn't know you did French lessons. I've seen your card in the window. <laughs> Right, uh, Clement Freud, 23 seconds, liaisons. And you have to take it in your own individual way. We've had French, we've had metal work, and um, we've got to be original and distinctive as you go on the subject liaison starting now. A liaison is no more than a relationship between one, two, three, even four, possibly five, maybe six people. <laughs> the Paul Merton challenge. Well, he's not talking about metal work, deviation. <laughs> metal work's not the subject, liaisons is. You did a metalwork version and the audience loved it. We all loved it. You got bonus Repetition points. of maybe. No, he didn't say maybe. No, no, he didn't. Hesitation. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
the fact he wasn't speaking in French. Uh, right, 13 seconds. Still with you, Clement, starting now. Man kann natürlich auf Deutsch dieses Wort übersprechen, wenn man will und die Sprache sprechen kann. Tony Hawks of China. Repetition of Sprechen. Uh, I think the final score is settled, and Peter, we haven't heard from you on this round, and it's gone sort of rather bizarre and rather anarchic, and, uh, and I'd like to hear your version for the last four seconds on liaisons, and you have to take it in a different direction, a different language, a different concept. <laughs> <laughs> and you have four seconds in which to achieve that, if you possibly can, starting now. Well, I'd enjoy telling you about one or two liaisons that I've had in the past. <laughs> So Peter Jones decided to take it in an utterly English way, as becomes his personality. How delightful, Peter. But he was on a unicycle, as he was saying it. I know, I know, which is, doesn't come over very well on radio. Um, let me give you the final score, because I'm sure you're just panting to know what it is, aren't you? You can't wait to hear, can you, this audience out here. Gosh, they're so hot, they can't wait to go home. Right. <laughs> Uh, for once, Clement Freud finished in fourth place. He was a few points behind Peter Jones, who finished in a very strong third place, one point behind Paul Merton. But out in the lead, a few points ahead, was Tony Hawk. So we say, Tony, you are our winner this week. We do hope you've enjoyed this particular edition of uh, Just a Minute. I would say uh, bonsoir, boni, and in Chinese, and uh, all the other languages, and thank our four intrepid, delightful, and amazing exponents of this game, Paul Merton, Tony Hawkes, Clement Freud, and Peter Jones. Also thank Jane Gibson, who has blown her whistle so magnificently as well. Help me with the score on the stopwatch. We thank Emessa for creating the game and make sure that we all have a such fun when we come to the radio theatre here, and our producer, Chris Neal, who produced and directs it. From all of them, from me, Nick Parsons, thank you for tuning in. Thank our lovely audience here in the radio theatre. Tune in the next time we take to the air and play just a minute to them from all of us here. Goodbye, goodbye. <laughs> goodbye. Hello, uh, this is Nicholas Parsons. And the recording of Just a Minute you're about to hear features Derek Nimmo, who sadly died recently. The BBC, with the agreement of Derek's family, had decided to broadcast the show as a tribute to him. It was, incidentally, his last professional engagement before his tragic fall, the consequences of which finally overwhelmed him. Derek Nimmo was one of the stalwarts of Just a Minute. He'd been in the original pilot show with me over 34 years ago, and his clever, witty and sometimes outrageous contributions to the programme were always a joy and delight. Our friendship goes back even further, and it was because of this he was able on occasions to be incredibly rude to me in the show. It's only when you know someone extremely well can you make fun of them in public and the listeners enjoy it, because they know there's no malice intended. Derek was a skilled comedy performer, equally at home on the stage or before the television cameras. He was also a very fine after-dinner speaker and a most successful entrepreneur, sending productions of plays around the world. He brought all his performance skills and love of travel into just a minute. He was exceptional, individual, and a rare comic talent. Please enjoy him once again in what was one of his favourite programmes. Welcome to Just a Minute! Hello, my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute walls fades away, once more it is my pleasure to welcome our many listeners throughout the world, and also the four exciting, exuberant, attractive players of the game who are going to compete this week. We welcome back a young comedian with his own distinctive and individual style, that is Tony Hawkes, another young comedian with his own original style, and that is Graham Norton, a comedy player who's developed his style many years ago, and it is still a fresh day. <laughs> as it was then, that is Derek Nimmo, and a young comedian whose style is which is as distinctive as she is attractive, and that is Linda Smith. Will you please welcome all four of them? <laughs> 
And as usual, I'm going to ask them to speak on the subject that I give them, and they will have to do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviating from the subject. Beside me sits Elaine Wigley, who's going to help me keep the score. She has a stopwatch, which she will hold, which will tell me how many seconds has gone by. She also has a whistle to blow when the 60 seconds are up. And this particular edition of Just a Minute is coming from the Lyceum Theatre in Sheffield. We enjoyed ourselves so much when we were here a few weeks ago... (laughs) The invitation went out again, and we accepted with alacrity. And we have an exciting, warm, but certainly not a dual Yorkshire audience who are not feeling the cold at all, even though they live in a very cold part of the country. Right. And um, we're going to begin the show this week with Graham Norton, and who better? Graham, the subject is, what makes me furious? Will you tell us something about that subject in this game starting now? I thank you, Nicholas, for this opportunity to rant quietly about what makes me furious. It is, in fact, when technology is not ready to be introduced to the marketplace, and yet they do. For example, Video Plus. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it doesn't actually perform the task it's intended to. The end of the film is coming close. And somebody says the person who did the murder was shaken back. You better shake... And (laughs) it's very irritating. Other things that annoy me, because, dear God, I've nothing else to say about that, (laughs) there are... (laughs) Terry Hawk's challenge. Uh, I think there may have been a hesitation there. I think there was a hesitation. So, it was lovely, wasn't it? Uh, Tony, you have a correct challenge, so you get a point for your correct challenge. You take over the subject. There are 16 seconds available. What makes me furious, starting now? I am so calm and at peace with myself that I very rarely get furious about anything. But there is one particular area where I'm not always happy and that's when I'm putting on a duvet cover. It's so (laughs) difficult and I can never... (laughs) Whoever is speaking when the whistle goes gains an extra point and on this occasion it was Tony Hawkes. And Linda, will you take the next round? The subject, my party piece. Talk on the subject starting now. When I was little, my party piece used to be to sing along to my favourite Scylla Black song, Anyone Who Had a Heart. Everyone thought it was charming how times change. These days, my party piece is to drink industrial quantities of Chardonnay, then pumps fads because I'm so drunk I've forgotten I don't smoke, then sing Firestarter by Prodigy. Nobody seems to find it delightful in any way at all. Why do- Graham Norton challenge. Graham, what was your challenge? Uh, were there two sings? Yes, she sing along. She did sing more than once. Uh, you have a correct challenge, Graham. So you all take right. over the subject. All right. My party piece, 30 seconds, starting now. My party piece is perhaps a little visual. It is to do an impression of a small terrier dog making love. <laughs> it goes something like this. <laughs> I must explain to our listeners... No, no, Nicholas, don't. I have to. The audience have laughed and all the listeners will wonder, why were they laughing? And the reason was that Graham Norton gave a brilliant... His features took on that of a little terrier dog and his little tongue came out and it made licking movements. It was worth the laugh. But you've lost the subject. Yes, I thought as much. Yes, because Derek challenge, hesitation. Derek, my party piece, 16 seconds starting now. Well, my party piece used to be to waggle my toes and say nursery rhymes to them. This was tremendously popular. I went on the name and Andrew show with Bob Hope and Bing Crosby and did my party piece, which received a tremendous acclaim. Yes, Derek Nimmo speaking as the whistle went gained that extra point, and he's now alongside Tony Hawkes in the lead. Uh, Derek, it's your turn to begin. The subject, steel. Talk on it, Derek, 60 seconds starting now. Here I am in the city of steel. Well, that it used to be. 40,000 people were employed in the industry and nine-tenths of the world's knives were made here. My great-grandfather was a master cutler and lived in this fine 
wondrous place. I <laughs> was told by him, never ask anyone if he's a Yorkshireman, because if he is, he will already have told you. <laughs> uh, and if he isn't, you don't want to humiliate him. <laughs> but he lived here for these many years. Of course, I can think of Tommy Steele, who was discovered in the Three Eyes coffee shop in Old Compton Street in Soho, and David Steele, that marvellous man who led the Liberal Party for so long after the collapse of the previous head of that organisation. <laughs> but Steele is something which Sheffield is playing. Oh, Tony, you challenge with two seconds ago. You went for 58 <laughs> seconds. And if you go for the full 60, you get an extra bonus oh, point. But, dear. Tony, you got in, yes. It was a hesitation. Two seconds for you on steel, starting now. It is wrong to steal, but I'm going to say exactly what Derek... <laughs> oh, I think this has been chosen specially for you, Graham. Bright young things. <laughs> Will you tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now? Bright Young Things is a lovely way of describing babies living near Sellafield. <laughs> Often oh. on the evening, you can see the glow emanating across the fields. Nervous children living there don't need to worry about... Uh, Derek Nimmo's challenged you. There's no children. Yes, there were children before, yes. So, Derek, you've got in on this Bright Young Things, and you have 41 seconds to tell us something about it, starting now. I remember years ago when Nicholas Parsons and I were bright young things. Flappers in the 1920s, down the strand we go, <laughs> tossing our pearls over our shoulders, playing kisses to passing guardsmen, and they would say, they are bright young things. And we were. It's so sad to see him now. In the first, in the first flush of his senility, I remember that he too, and I, what we were. Bright young um, Linda challenged. Yes, Linda, uh, what was your... Several repetitions of we were. We were, yes, definitely. Hesitation and rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> and deviation as well, yes. So, Linda, you have ten seconds on bright young things starting now. Bright young things, in my experience, certainly don't work in DIY superstores. <laughs> Quite the reverse, I find. They're really rather stupid young... So Linda Smith, speaking as the whistle wing, gained that extra point for doing so and uh, has moved forward. But, um, Tony, it's your turn to begin as well. Keeping a straight face. Tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now. If I look out at an audience and see nothing but straight faces, then, as a comedian, I'm not really doing my job properly. But I used to do a good deal of acting in the past, and it was important to be able to keep a straight face. It was no good being told by a fellow uh, thespian on stage that your mother had died in a Greek tragedy and then burst out laughing because someone had dropped their kecks in the wings. <laughs> Frankly, it was not on. I used to keep a straight face in the cupboard under the stairs. <laughs> For about four years it was there. I used to bring it out at parties and wave it around and then uh, put it away again. <laughs> Derek, you challenge. No hesitation. Yes, he said a definite uh, there, so that's hesitation. Derek, you have a correct challenge. Another point, of course. Two seconds to go. <laughs> Now you've got a full 25 to tell us something about keeping a straight face, starting now. It is sometimes very difficult to keep a straight face on stage. I used to work with a lovely lady called Maureen Lipman, and she is most difficult to keep a straight face with because she's always pulling funny ones. And I don't know... Geoffrey Palmer, do you know him? Sour-faced old fellow. Well, he is terribly difficult to keep a straight face with as well because he makes you giggle. And I know if I'm sitting in the audience like you are tonight and I see people... So, Derek did keep going to the whistle when gained that extra point. He's equaling the lead with Tony Hawks at the end of the round. Graham Norton, your turn to begin. The subject, Seven Hills. Tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now. Imagine my delight when I sat in my hotel room and picked up a colourful, lavishly illustrated brochure which announced, if you like hills, you'll love Sheffield. <laughs> because, as you 
know, but I didn't. It's built on seven hills. How did that happen, I wonder? <laughs> Presumably, it was, in fact, built on one hill. And Oh, oh dear, Tony challenged. Uh, repetition of built. Well spotted. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> the generosity. Right. Tony, 28 seconds for you on seven hills, starting now. Jimmy Hill, Gordon Hill, Damon Hill, Harry Hill, Box Hill... The hills are alive with the sound of music. I could go on. Rome wasn't built in a day. That was constructed on seven hills also, but it's not a patch on Sheffield. Frankly, you see no tourists going there. Well, people, I often feel like going to the tourist tour there and saying, why are you in this Italian city when you could be in Yorkshire visiting the seven hills there? There's much more to see and more Roman remains, I thought. <laughs> So, Tony, you've taken a lead. You're an extra point for speaking as a whistle when you've gone ahead. And Derek Nimmo, will you take the next round? My current craze. What a lovely subject. 60 seconds, as usual, starting now. Well, in my long life, I've witnessed many crazes. There used to be hula hoops. Now it seems to be yo ditters that everybody has, <laughs> pulling them up and down with little gears cunningly put inside them. But I have a current craze this year, which, curious enough, is currants, because I had a surfeit of strawberries, an extravagance of raspberries, far too many blackberries, and then at the end of the summer I thought to myself, oh, currants, those little sultanas, <laughs> and I put them into cakes and into pies, and also the red ones, and also those lords. Uh, well, Tony Hawks has challenged you. Well, there were quite a lot of also's. And yes, quite a lot you were also a bit too much, uh, oh, Derek. Right, yeah. Yes, but you did very well. I mean, you... I'll get you for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tony Hawks, you challenge, a correct challenge, a point for that, of course. 21 seconds available. My current craze starting now. My current craze are Ronnie and Reggie. I went out and bought toy replicas of them. And I play with them at home. I was quite keen on snowboarding. I did that for a while. I did it on Hampstead Heath in the summer. It was no fun, I have to tell you. It's far better to go to Verbier or somewhere in Switzerland. And... Oh. <laughs> so Tony Hawk spoke as a whistle wind, gained that extra point, and he's moved into second place behind Graham Norton. And Linda Smith, it's your turn to begin. The subject is critic. Tell us something about that in this game starting now. Kenneth Tynan said a critic is someone who knows where to go but doesn't know how to drive the car. This makes a critic the opposite of a minicab driver <laughs> who knows how to drive the car but doesn't know how to get there, in my experience. This is particularly true in South London, I find, where many... Oh, dear God, surely that's a minute. <laughs> Graham Norton, you challenge. I sensed she wanted me to. <laughs> so do we interpret that as hesitation, I suppose, so, or even deviation? That Just must... giving up. <laughs> Just giving up the will to live, really. <laughs> yes. right. 36 seconds, Graham. Critic starting now. It is a little-known fact that critic is a French word, meaning sad wannabe who was bullied in school <laughs> and wants to get back at the world for a living. <sighs> oh, read them and weep. I have no idea, really, why anyone would want to be a critic. When I was in school, I remember right... Thank um, God for that. <laughs> Linda challenge. A repetition of school. That's right, yes. Oh, yes. 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 <laughs> Linda, you got in, but you've only nine seconds to go on critic starting now. Some rather smug people say, oh, I'm my own worst critic. How on earth can they possibly know that? They don't know what we're saying about them, do they? So, Linda Smith, speaking as a whistle when getting that extra point, she's uh, equal in second place with Graham Norton there behind Tony Hawks and Derek Nimmer, who are out in the lead together. Derek, your turn to begin. The subject, the wild card. Tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now. Well, a wild card is someone who is unpredictable, and I would suggest 
David Shaler, that curious man who was employed by the MI5, must be a very wild card indeed. How did the intelligence service get someone who was such a loose canner and employ him? I've never seen anyone look so shifty and unpleasant. He's <laughs> sitting there in France, eating off the lap. He can't come back here and sue me, by the way, because if he does, he'll be nabbed and put in the nearest thing. <laughs> Jolly good too. And I... His girlfriend looks equally curious to me, but I cannot imagine how wild part when we have these people... But Tony, you pressed uh, your buzzer. Repetition of imagine. That's right, yes, more than that, yes, but there we are. uh, Tony, 22 seconds. The wild card, starting now. The wild card can be used in poker. We used to have some magnificent games. Paul Merton, who's an illustrious player of this game, we'd go round his house and play into the night. It was magnificent. Sometimes you'd have so many wilds. Derek Challenge. Repetition of magnificent. It was too magnificent, I'm afraid. It was. Uh, (laughs) Ten seconds. Derek, back with you. The wild card, starting now. You can change the colour or the suit or any kind of rule that you, if you're dealing, want to inflict. And that can be for the wild card. Now, when I was in Vegas... Derek Nimmo speaking as the whistle went gain that extra point. He's in second place behind Tony Hawks at the end of that round. And Tony, we're with you. It's your turn to begin again. And the subject is the arrest. Can you tell us something about that in this game, starting now? Last night I went out in Sheffield, drank 14 pints of lager, climbed to the top of the town hall, stripped naked and sang the entire repertoire of the Spice Girls hits accompanying myself on the organ. <laughs> The arrest that followed was swift and devastating. (laughs) The officer came up to me and said, hello, bonjour, good day, taking care not to repeat those words, which was handy for me in recounting this story. (laughs) And he said, you've already taken down what I want for evidence. And I made a statement and was taken off. I made a citizen's arrest once as an audience. Uh, Derek Nimmo challenge. Repetition made. Yes, you were making, yes, a lot there. Derek, with you, the arrest, 14 seconds, starting now. I was in my room in the Cadogan Hotel, number 14, I think it was, when I suddenly heard a, a rat-tat-ditto on the door, and I opened it outside was a Bobby Peeler, or I think a policeman, as you might call it today, and they said, we are here to arrest you, and they took me down to Chelsea Hospital, which was very near to the police station, so it was quite a good place to be, really. And they said... <laughs> Derek Nimmo speaking as a whistle and gain that extra point. He's now in a lead at just one ahead of Tony Hawkes. Graham Norton, your turn to begin. Scent. Tell us something about that delicious subject in this game, starting now. It remains a mystery to me why they name scents the way they do. Who wants to smell like Old Spice? Surely it should be fresh, vibrant. Mmm, Basil, I love you. But however, a scent like jazz is to perfume what that is to music. Pointless dreariness in the air. There's a new one now that Calvin Klein has just introduced called Contradiction. Why? Somebody says, I love your perfume. No, you don't. (laughs) I'd like to go home with you. No, you wouldn't. It's a curious name for anything. As a young boy, I would sit in the car beside my father, being driven to the school hop, (laughs) reeking of blue stratos. was a popular thing at the time. Now, of course, draw near. Well, that hasn't happened for quite a while. Someone started with the subject and went the full 60 seconds. No hesitation, repetition or deviation, and he was not interrupted. Graham, you get only a point for speaking when the whistle went. A bonus point for not being interrupted. Hard work for two points, but well done. (laughs) And you're still in third place. (laughs) Linda, it's your turn to begin. A lovely subject, a swift half. Tell us something about that in this game starting now. A swift? Half a quick little drink, probably with a chum, is so much nicer than a half swift, such as the cat might leave in the kitchen for you to find. 
Charming, equally unpleasant, a half swallow, a half pigeon, a half wren, a half... Um, a half... <laughs> Tony, are you challenged? I think there was a hesitation. Half uh, a hesitation. There is definite hesitation. Tony, 41 seconds, a swift half, starting now. Last night, I went out in Sheffield and drank 28 swift <laughs> half. I climbed to the top of the town hall, removed my clothing, and sang the entire repertoire of the Spice Girls' hits whilst accompanying myself on the organ. This is an example of what not to do. Normally, you should just have a swift half, maybe... Uh, Derek Nimmer challenge. I don't think they have been could be very swift halves if you had 28 of them. <laughs> they must oh, be rather the country, slow they're halves. They're oh. incredibly quick if you've got to get 28 in, I tell you. <laughs> I mean, a swift half, each half was swift. No, he wasn't deviating from the subject. So, 21 seconds, were you, Tony, still a swift half starting now? The second half of Sheffield Wednesday against Manchester United went very swiftly for me because I was enjoying the scoreline of 3-1. That was an example of a swift half that you don't imbibe, but one that you watch. I can't pretend... Uh, hello, how much? <laughs> Ev Norton challenge. Yeah, no, that, that was, a bit <laughs> that was yes. hesitation, and you cleverly got in with four seconds to go on a swift half, Graham, starting now. Thanks to penalty shootouts, hurrah, what a great idea. <laughs> swift <laughs> half. <laughs> well, Tony Hawkes is still in the lead, Derek Nimmo is coming up one behind him, and Graham Norton's creeping up, and Linda Smith is following him. And Derek. It's your turn to begin. The subject is quotations. Tell us something about that in this game, starting now. I always like that quotation of Coral Brown's when she said she could never see what Sir Godfrey Turl could see in the actress Jill Bennett until she went to Caprice and saw her eating corn on the cob. I always think that was a rather amusing <laughs> idea, really. And that line of Oscar Wilde's, and he said, never make love to a Methodist standing up because it could lead to dancing. <laughs> If you're going to a building contractor, it's very important to get a quotation first, because otherwise you will be done horribly. I have experience with a company called First Direct, and they tell me how much it was going to cost, but unfortunately, when the bill arrived, it had doubled. And look the gentle day before the wheels of Phoebus, round about dapples the drowsy east to a spot to go. <laughs> Thanks to you all and leavers. Mr. and Mrs. Ramsbottom. <laughs> right. Well, that doesn't often happen in just a minute. Two complete rounds, no interruptions, no hesitation, repetition, deviation. Well done. So we're moving into the last round, alas. And Tony Hawkes, it's your turn to begin. And the subject is apron strings. 60 seconds, as usual, and your time starts now. I was tied to my mother's apron strings for a long period of my life, but fortunately they were incredibly long. So she lived in Buenos Aires, and I was brought up <laughs> in Brighton. Sometimes shipping would get entangled in them, <laughs> causing enormous difficulties to the commercial business that went on on the oceans. I also used to play... Ah, Graham Norton challenged. There were two ons, weren't there? Uh, yes. On, yeah. You all heard them. <laughs> so, correct challenge, another point, uh, Graham. Apron Strings is with you starting now. Apron Strings is a dull topic and yet I will go on. <laughs> I'm not in favour of the domestic bow at the back when tying them. <laughs> Having worked in restaurants, I favour the twice round up the front and little... Um, <laughs> Linda, you challenged. Was there a repetition of favour? Did you favour yes, twice? Yes, you did. Yes. I favour, yes. I don't favour the bow at the back, I favour... Yes, well done. Well, listen, Linda, yes, the last round, yeah. they're all... No, I could have fought it. Because yes. <laughs> no, God knows no-one was listening. <laughs> <laughs> so, Linda, you've got in on the subject of apron strings. There are 23 seconds left, starting now. Like Graham, I prefer the bow at the front. It looks so much more professional, like the two fat ladies or somebody like that. Some TV... Uh, Derek Nimmo challenge. Tradition of like. Like that. There was too many likes. I'm sorry, Linda. So, Derek's got in with 15 seconds to go on this subject. Apron strings, starting now. If you are a bishop of the Church of England, you would wear an apron with strings at time front. Similarly, should you be a Freemason, you would wear, as an entrance apprentice, 
an apron with strings that have to be tied, not the And uh, Tony Fox <laughs> challenged. Uh, repetition of tied. Tied, yes, that's right. <laughs> and Tony, you've cleverly got in <laughs> with <laughs> one second to go. <laughs> <laughs> And I think we're going to make it a very tight contest at the end of the result of that last challenge. One second. Apron strings, Tony, starting now. Apron strings. <laughs> so let me give you the final score. Linda Smith, who's not played the game as much as the others, just finished in fourth place, just behind Graham Norton in third place. <laughs> Two the same points, 11 points each. De Derek Nimmo and Tony Hawks are our joint winners. <laughs> Why does it really matter where they come? It's the contributions they make and they were all wonderful and lovely and delightful and I do thank Linda Smith right at the top there, Tony Hawks, Graham Norton, Derek Nimmo for the one wonderful contribution. We thank them. I thank Elaine Wigley for keeping the score so magnificently and giggling so charmingly in my ear hole and also uh, helping with everything. <laughs> and also our producer, Chris Neal, who produces the show, keeps us all in order when he possibly can. And of course the creator of the game, Ian Messiter, we're deeply grateful to him and particularly grateful to this lovely Yorkshire audience of the Lyceum Theatre Sheffield for encouraging us on our way. Thank you so much. We've enjoyed ourselves here in Sheffield. From me, Nicholas Parsons, goodbye! <laughs> Welcome to Just a Minute. Hello, my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away, once more it is my real pleasure to welcome not only our many listeners throughout the world, but also the four talented, diverse performers from different areas of show business who this week are going to partake and compete in just a minute. We welcome the actor, playwright, wit, Peter Jones, the lyricist, writer, cricket buff, Tim Rice, comedian and actress, Jenny Eclair, and that comedian, presenter and stand-up, Stephen Frost. Would you please welcome all four of them! As usual, I am going to ask them to speak on the subject that I give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviation. And they will score points or lose points accordingly. Beside me sits Elaine Wigley, who's going to help me keep the score. She will hold the stopwatch and blow a whistle when the 60 seconds are up. And this particular edition of Just a Minute is coming from the Corn Exchange in Brighton, where we have been asked back again to perform another show. <laughs> Stephen Frost, would you like to begin? And the uh, first subject on the card here is giving your all. So you gave your all last time you were here, to great effect. <laughs> Would you talk on the subject now of giving your all, starting now? It is important as a performer to be seen to be giving your all. It's no good walking on stage and just talking in low form and not committing yourself. Uh... And Jenny Eclair has oh, challenged very, very rapidly. Very clumsy, wasn't it? There what? was hesitation, there was all sorts going on there. I wasn't giving my all, was I? <laughs> Poor <laughs> man hardly like got that. going. He's really been going for eight seconds. Like a baby. <laughs> no, no, he can talk like a baby if he wants to. I mean, you can put on a voice, you can go into a He character. hesitated. Steve, did oh, you Oh, Jenny, don't try so hard. <laughs> no, I disagree with your challenge, Jenny. And so Steve gets a point for an incorrect challenge, keeps the subject, and there are 52 seconds left, Stephen, starting now. When you go on stage, you've got to be confident uh, and loud and, and give Tim them Rice. what you've got. You've got to show them oh, what you're doing. I'm sorry, made. Steve, I don't stop <laughs> Tim Rice, you challenged. Two stages. I'm afraid you've mentioned stage before. Yes. So, Tim, that was a correct challenge. You get a point for correct challenge. 50 seconds available. Giving your all, starting now. Last Christmas, I was given by my father a toolbox as a present, and I was thrilled. Within this receptacle, I found a spare. Uh, Peter Jones challenge. No, I shouldn't have said that. But he said I twice. <laughs> And you have won a point for the correct challenge and 40 seconds available, giving your all, starting now. If you happen to be a cobbler and you give your all, you're departing with an intrinsic part of your face. 
<laughs> so, Jim, you got back in again. Hesitation. Hesitation, yes. 31 seconds, giving your all, Tim, starting now. As I was saying, within this thing, which had four sides and a lid, there were lots of tools. Uh, uh, Jenny, challenge. Tiny hesitation. He didn't actually hesitate, Jenny. Oh. So, um, we love hearing from you, Jenny, so don't, don't give up. I'll try uh, again. We'll try again, yes. <laughs> so, Tim, carry on. Another point, 23 seconds, giving your all, starting now. Among the collection of implements was... Uh, Stephen, you challenged. Yeah, uh, deviation. It's the third time Tim's spoken. He's not mentioned giving it I'm, your all. I'm trying thought. to get this. He's, he's just going about his Christmas present of his father, <laughs> from his father. I think, yes, he hasn't really got... He, he hasn't got to the nub of the He hasn't got to the nub of the matter. He hasn't actually right. given his all yet, has he? So, uh, Steve, you had a correct challenge. Steve, 20 seconds on giving your all starting now. Giving your all is actually Cockney rhyming stang. <laughs> Tim... <laughs> I've never heard so many brief contributions in my life to any one subject. I've got something else on my mind. I shouldn't be here, really. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, you got in first with the hesitation. 16 seconds. Let's hear about your all. For goodness sake, giving your all, Tim, starting now. But in stark contrast to my previous story, I would like to regale you with the time when I gave my all. It was a critical moment in my career. Everything was looking bleak, black. Um, uh, uh, Stephen, you're challenged. His careers always look bleak and black. <laughs> 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 From where I'm standing. <laughs> so we give you a bonus point for a good challenge, but Tim gets a point because he was interrupted. He keeps the subject with seven seconds on giving your all starting now. What is the point of giving your all when lesser men challenge everything you say? It is absolutely a waste of time. And you've been challenged again by lesser men. Uh, Stephen, what was your challenge? Well, I think I'm taller than Tim. I'm six foot five. <laughs> so I'm not a lesser man. So that's deviation. I claim, I claim the subject. <laughs> he didn't establish lesser in height. Too. He was referring to other things. We so don't know that. <laughs> we don't know that. If he, meant, if he meant the other way, then there's going to be a fight after the show. <laughs> uh, we, we have to assume that, uh, Stephen, but we, we still like the challenge, so we're going to give you a bonus point Thank for that, because it was a good, subtle <laughs> challenge. But uh, to be fair to Tim, he must keep the po uh, subject and another point. Four seconds, giving you all starting now. Giving your all. Who would have thought that giving your all could be such a difficult... <laughs> <laughs> well, I must say, that is the longest the first round of Just a Minute has ever gone. And a, a total of um, 12 points were scored in the round, <laughs> of which seven went to Tim Rice, <laughs> four to Stephen Frost, one to Peter Jones, and Jenny Clare has yet to score. <laughs> Um, Peter, it's your turn to begin. Would you tell us something about the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam? <laughs> and there are 60 seconds if you want them. <laughs> <laughs> Starting now. Well, it's a Persian poem which was translated by Edward Fitzgerald. And perhaps the best known line is a loaf of bread, a glass of wine, and thou. And I've always been uh, Jenny challenged. I'm very really sorry, but I think the line goes, a jug of wine, a loaf of bread. It's that way round. It's a jug of wine, a loaf of bread, and thou. I'm not uh, <laughs> trying to be particularly accurate. Oh, I, was. I was quoting from the original Persian. <laughs> All right, here's what I do. I give Peter a bonus point for his excuse and Jenny a point for a correct challenge and so there are 47 seconds for her to tell us something about the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam starting a now. A jug of wine, a loaf of bread and thou beside me singing in the wilderness. Or is it in the wilderness singing? <laughs> uh, you shouldn't have paused. They wouldn't have no, known. No, I forgot it. I know. I know, but they wouldn't have known. Jenny. No, you nobody knows you much about gone. this. I think it was uh, written by the ancestor of that bloke. Oh, you, I'm sorry, you've, you've been challenged. <laughs> oh, so don't waste it. You might get in again. Oh, right. I'll try and Tim, get in again. Tim challenged, and there was hesitation. Yeah. 38 seconds, Tim. The Please. Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, starting now. A pint of milk, half a bitter, and bread. <laughs> these are the things that inspired the Persian sage to write these wonderful lines all those centuries ago. He was cruising down the back streets of downtown Tehran when suddenly he was approached by a lady who said, like a good time. He said, yes, but I can't see how you can help me. As a result, <laughs> he went up to his lonely garret and was inspired to write some of the most moving verses that have ever graced 
Middle Eastern culture, and I look forward one day to reading it, either in the original Persian or possibly... Peter Jones Challenge. He said Persian before. Uh, he sorry. did say Persian before, yes. Peter. So you got in cleverly with only two seconds to go on the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, starting now. I don't care which came first, but priority. <laughs> It doesn't matter which came first, Peter. You got in before the whistle, and you got that extra point for speaking as the whistle went. You had other points in the round bonus, and you're equal in second place with Stephen Frost, just behind our leader, Tim Rice. And Jenny, your turn to begin. Round Robin, that's the subject. Tell us something about it in this game, starting now. A round robin is one of those ghastly, smug letters you get from relatives abroad that gets photocopied, sent to all the people they've left behind, just to remind them how well they're doing in foreign climes, with their swimming pools outside and their oranges growing in their garden. Gardens, and they go on and on about how their kids are really... <laughs> See when you challenge. Two ons there. Uh, on I, I went on and on. On and on, yeah. yeah. I became dull. Yeah. 44 seconds. On and on. Round Robin is with you, Stephen, starting now. When a mutiny was about to take place on a ship in the 18th century, they all signed a letter, but it was a round robin, a piece of parchment <laughs> in the... <laughs> Jenny. Dreadful hesitation. Dreadful. Oh, don't rub it in. He hesitated. <laughs> Jenny, 36 seconds. Round Robin, starting now. Round Robin's the sort of things you get on the front of Christmas cards. You wouldn't want to get one with a miserable, uh, emaciated bird. Uh, 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 Stephen, your challenge. Get two gets. Two, two gets there. Uh, oh. You get them on, you wouldn't want to get one. No, get, no, 31 wouldn't. seconds. Round Robin, back with you, Stephen Frost, starting now. In my garden every winter, a little round Robin bob bobs off. Oh, <laughs> I just like interrupting, I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a difficult game, yeah. they don't realise it. But Especially Jenny got in first, Bob Bobbing, 27 seconds, Jenny, round Robin, starting now. A collection of fat blokes, all called Robin, might be called a collection. Uh, oh, oh, Tim Jones, yeah. why? A couple of collections, hesitations. Yes. yes, a collection, right, Tim, you got in. 23 seconds, Tim, round Robin, starting now. Round Robin is what Batman is most of the time. They are a wonderful <laughs> team, and they go visiting skyscrapers, flying round Gotham City, and basically chasing the bad guys such as the Riddler, the Penguin, the Joker, and doing good generally. This has been featured in at least four big movies, and the first three were pretty awful, so I didn't even bother to go and see the fourth in the series. <laughs> <laughs> So that last little sequence of Tim's was the longest session we've had in this particular edition of Just a Minute. And Tim, your turn to begin. The getaway car. Tell us something about that in this game, starting now. I've got a getaway car. It goes beep, beep, and it is an uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Last time we were playing this game in Brighton, we had trouble with beeps, didn't we? Yes, we have uh, yes. two beeps. Yes. Uh, Jenny, you got in there. Uh, the getaway car, 51 seconds, starting now. Traditionally, the getaway car is a Jaguar or a Daimler. No self-respecting criminal would drive a getaway car that was a Vauxhall Nova, say. My boyfriend has a Jaguar. I said, why do you need a getaway car? He said, to get away from uh, you. Uh, Steve, right. <laughs> Stephen, new challenge. D uh, two Jaguars, though. There were two Jaguars, unfortunately. Yeah. Yes. Oh. I mean, um, not I got every... my joke in anyway. Mm. I know. <laughs> 45 seconds, the getaway car, with you, Stephen, starting now. I drove a getaway car once in my teenagerhood, and I got caught by the police, and I didn't have a license, and they did me for that, but not driving the actual motor vehicle that was getting the people away from the situation, <laughs> which we were actually getting away from at the... <laughs> I think the people of Brighton will always remember you for your struggles, uh, Stephen. <laughs> there. Jenny, you got in first. There are 35 seconds, the getaway car, starting now. Getaway cars squeal away from the curb and go very fast through boxes, empty cardboard boxes. I don't know why they do. Uh, Tim Rice challenge on the Race boxes, boxes. I'm sure. Sorry. Yes, yes, 29 seconds. The getaway car, Tim, starting now. What baffles me about getaway cars in the movies is that they are never clamped. They can always find a place to park. Never on a double white line. Uh, never, 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 Stephen never. challenge. Never, never land. Never, 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 never land, yes. yes. A 21 seconds, Stephen. Getaway car, starting now. The best getaway car, of course, is the Robin Reliant. Because it only has three wheels, there's less chance of it being clamped, as Tim was mentioning there. They go around corners very fast and lean left or right, depending on which way you move the steering wheel. The speed is not that great, but this fools the police, who tend to chase Jaguars. <laughs> Uh, 
Well, Stephen Frost is complaining that he, uh, he's not skilled at playing this game, but he's got another point there, another point for speaking as whistle went. He's moved forward. He's only two points behind our leader, Tim Rice. So he's doing very well. And Stephen, it's your turn to begin. The subject, Francophile. Tell us something about that in just... Who said, oh? <laughs> Francophile. Six, uh, 60 seconds starting now. I'm a bit of a Francophile myself. I love going over the water and going to the, the country... <laughs> Jenny Challenge. He said going twice. Yeah, he was going too oh, far. Being yes. twice. <laughs> Jenny, Francophiles. 55 seconds, starting now. Francophiles are lovers of all things French. I do not suffer from this condition, being the only person in the world that thinks that France is a bit of a dump. You can keep your gouloir, your horse meat. Uh, who, Stephen, you challenged? Xenophobia. <laughs> no, she said two yours there. Yes. Two yours, and there was going to be a more a list. Of, and, uh, two what? Sorry. Yours. You can keep yours, you can keep yours. Yes, I said yours. that twice. And were gonna, right. you were going to do another one as well. 40, not, no, 44 say. seconds. Yeah. Francophile starting now. So there's nothing better than a plate of cheese from Normandy, a bowl of soup from the Dordogne, and a woman from the deepest heart of Paris. <laughs> These are the things that keep me happy in the winter nights when I'm travelling across that great country that once President de Gaulle presided over it in that oh-so-fantastic way he did in that little flat teepee hat of his. <laughs> Mais bien sûr, vous a dit à moi, c'est beaucoup de vin, il y en a personne là-bas qui parle comme moi. Elle aime manger les repas de français, les langoustes, Quand les corbettes. Quand j'en ai mis, j'en comme à moi. Faut qu'on dit, on peut qu'on t'a mis en venir. Faut qu'on t'a mis en venir. Grosse chance, c'est un challenge à Tim Rice. Puis quand tu dis, on revient du jour au bout de... <laughs> anyway, I could shut him up. I had to go in my French. Um, Tim, you challenged first. What was it? I can't remember. I, I, I... <laughs> Should we call it showing off? Uh, well, it... I think my buzzer just got carried away with excitement and <laughs> admiration. So, Stephen, uh, you've got the benefit of the doubt because no one can remember what you repeated or uh, hesitated about. And, and um, Francophile, I think you were demonstrating you are a Francophile. I agree with you. 20 seconds, starting now. The French waiters are the best servers of food in the world. They have a certain style and panache that beats any other form of service industry in this country. Peter Jones, challenge. Well, they have to be to get the cheese from uh, one place and the soup from the Dordogne. <laughs> You've got a bonus point anyway, but what was the, what's the, what's the, what's within the rules of just a minute, what's your challenge? Well, he was just rambling on, wasn't he? <laughs> uh, well, I don't know that he was actually deviating from anything. We give you a bonus point because we love you. We give you the subject as well. Eleven seconds, Francophile, Peter, starting now. Well, I love the south of France, and I'd go there every winter if I had enough money, and I wouldn't do just a minute until April or May if they were able to. Uh, Jenny Challenge. Hesitation. No, no, no. It was, it was just teetering on hesitation. It didn't quite get there, no. <laughs> Benefit of the doubt is what I say. No hesitation. Another point to you, Peter. Two seconds ago, Francophile starting now. The uh, Battle of and Flowers. A, a, a Stephen Challenge. Repetition. <laughs> well, what of? I just want to say that's how it's in French. You say repetition. <laughs> <laughs> it's a similar word. All those hesitations you can say as well in oh, French. Right. They're all very right. similar words. Fine. It's oh, a great yes, thing about yes, France. Some words are the same as you. Well, I'll do it for you now. You've given Peter another point, by the way. A point. Uh, yes, really. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, Pierre. Yes. Pierre. Oui. <laughs> Vous avez gagné un autre point? The Battle of Flowers in Nice <laughs> is <laughs> one of these well, spectacles. <laughs> That, uh, uh, no, no. S'il vous uh, plaît, uh, continuez uh, sans hésitation, répétition ou déviation. Oh, c'est bon? <laughs> yes. Il y, a, il y a deux secondes. Deux? Deux secondes. You know? Uh, no, no hésitation, répétition, déviation. No. Uh, le subject? Charles de Gaulle. Francophile. Vous commencez maintenant. <laughs> uh, Tim, you challenged first. Hesitation. <laughs> he was lost. I mentioned there were two seconds to go, and uh, Elaine, who works my stopwatch for me, has now made it three seconds. <laughs> She'd gone backwards. You, you're hysterical, yes, aren't you, Elaine? Because in France, they're an hour behind. Uh, yes, Peter, another point.
So Peter Jones got the point for not speaking as the whistle went. Well, he's moved forward. He's now in second place. But equal in the lead now, Tim Rice with Stephen Frost. Peter, it's your turn to begin. The subject is my first night. Will you tell us something about it in this game, starting now? Well, it was a very traumatic experience altogether. <laughs> and I remember I was sort of uh, covered in some kind of uh, sticky material. <laughs> And uh, Peter, I didn't recognise my mother uh, immediately. <laughs> well, uh, after all, I was upside down. <laughs> and the doctor was uh, holding me by the ankles. And he was very elderly and kept shaking. What is it? You were actually challenged before you got hung upside down. Oh. Yes. But, but you were so funny that I'm going to give you three bonus points. Three? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. But you were challenged, so Tim, you were first. You have the uh, subject, 50 seconds available. My first night starting now. I remember my first night being sent away to boarding school at a very, very young age. <laughs> Jenny, Jenny. He very, said very, very, very twice. Yes. Uh, 44 seconds. My first night is with you, Jenny, starting now. I have only had the pleasure of a West End theatrical first night once. Just over a year ago, I made my debut in Nell Dunn steaming at the Piccadilly Theatre. Oh, it was marvellous that first night. My dressing room was full of bouquets, champagne, flowers. And then afterwards, we all went out for dinner and somewhere else picked up the tab. And then the reviews came out. And funnily enough, the play closed quite soon after that. <laughs> but it was a joyous experience. I'm very glad that I've been lucky enough to have done that. And um, the other first nights that I've had lets me have a think now. I don't know why you're letting me get away with this, because really... <laughs> <laughs> doesn't mm. anyone else want it? Yes. <laughs> and uh, Tim has uh, challenged you and let you off your hook there. Nine seconds for you, Tim, on my first night starting oh, now. I didn't know I only have nine seconds. I was left. only three years old. Do you mind? I'm trying to talk. <laughs> before, and it was heartbreaking for both my parents and... On that occasion, Tim Rice, the speaker of the whistle wing, got the extra point for doing so, and he's moved forward. He's in the lead, just ahead of Stephen Frost, equal now with Peter Jones and Jenny Clare. You're coming up from behind. And it's your turn, by the way, to begin. My concerns. Tell us something about those starting now. My concerns are none of your business, but all right, I will admit to being rather preoccupied with the ageing process. I do find it very difficult being sexy when you get to 38. Every time I wiggle my bum, my teeth fall out. What can you do? <laughs> All I can say is thank heavens for cosmetics. I do need a lot of makeup. I like the way it makes my face look ten years younger than my neck. <laughs> I know I should be more concerned with global warming, economics and world peace, but actually I'm rather more bothered by the fact that I've got hair coming out of my nose, ears, chin. Oh, what is to become of me? And I haven't got a pension either. Sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night screaming. Uh, Tim Rice, the challenger. What are you doing tonight? <laughs> <laughs> right, a bonus point to Tim Rice. We love the challenge, but Bravery. Jenny gets a point for her being interrupted. Keeps it 21 seconds still on my concerns, Jenny, starting now. Yes, and sometimes I wake up screaming, thinking, oh, no, I'm going to be 70 and I won't have any money. And I'm going to be waiting at a bus stop, thinking, oh, next Tuesday when I get my pension, I might be able to afford some wine uh, gums. Uh, Stephen Frost, yeah. Two pensions, no? I wish I could. Yeah. Yeah, pension, pension. Right, repetition. Yes, repetition. Well done, Stephen. Seven seconds. My concerns starting now. My concern is... Com oh, for goodness <laughs> sake! <laughs> Joking! Uh, Peter Jones, did you challenge then? I think you did. Did I? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I got the... Uh, I, uh, I, I so twitch occasionally. Yeah, that's right, that's right. <laughs> and uh, my concerns, Peter, starting now. My concerns are usually uh, Martin Spencer's, for instance. <laughs> that's one of them. So, uh, Tim Rice is still in the lead. Peter Jones has now crept up a little because he was, uh, got that extra point for speaking of the whistle wind. Then it's uh, Stephen Frost and Jenny Clare in that order. Stephen, your turn to begin. Routines. I'm sure you've got plenty of those, but tell us something about your routines, Stephen Frost, starting now. When I get up in the morning, the first thing I do is put my clothes on, which is a bit unusual because I haven't got undressed from the night before. <laughs> so I tend to go walking down the street looking like a Michelin man. 
This is one of my routines. The other routine I like to do is brush my teeth and make sure that they're all shiny and sparkly like they're supposed to be so I get no dental problems in the near future. My third routine I like to do is wash my body all over and rub it off with sandpaper. This makes the skin nice and shiny and fresh. Uh, Jenny, it's challenge. Shiny twice. Yes. Yeah, a bit shiny, yes. So, Jenny, you've got in on routines with 28 seconds to go starting now. I have some pre-show routines based on fear and suspicion. First, I put my lucky pants on, then my earrings of good fortune. Next thing I do is I tug my left earlobe twice, muttering a mantra, secret mantra that... Uh... Oh, so two mantras, right. Tim, you heard first. 13 seconds, routines with you, starting now. My routines are incredibly boring, nothing like as gripping... <laughs> Uh, Peter Jones challenge. Better stop now. <laughs> A bonus point for Peter Jones because we love the challenge, but he wasn't, uh, uh, Tim wasn't deviating within the rules of just a minute. So he has a point and the subject still, nine seconds available, routines. Tim, starting now. I have the most exciting routines you can imagine. I get up in the morning, I run five miles, I leap into the swimming pool, I feed the chickens, I boil myself an egg, then I go and write a poem. <laughs> if you can maintain that routine, uh, Tim, you must be exceptional. And so as we move into the final round, when your turn to begin, Peter Jones, the subject, new man. Will you tell us something about new man in 60 seconds, starting now? Well, I like Paul Newman. He's very good. <laughs> There's uh, wonderful blue eyes and everything. And then it's a shop in uh, Duke Street, I think it is. And they sell things uh, very uh, masculine. <laughs> Jenny, you challenge. Slight hesitation. Board Slight hesitation. No, definitely. Uh, twice. 48 seconds. <laughs> new man. With you, Jenny. Tell us about your new man, starting now. Oh, God save us from the new man clogging up the supermarket, talking to his children as if they were normal human beings. <laughs> Don't they make you puke? Oh, give me a man in a cowboy hat who sits back, shuts up, and soaks up any stray bullets and buys the drinks till bedtime. That's what I want. None of your soppy, wimpy old new bloke. Anyway, it's an old-fashioned concept. I think women made them up in the 70s when they liked the idea of watching men cry. Ah, yes. <laughs> And then as soon as they started weeping their soppy tears, we looked at them and thought, you pathetic little <laughs> creatures. Come on, I want a thick, leathery-skinned bloke that tears the hides off buffalo for their woman <laughs> and goes out and brings me... Um... <laughs> <laughs> And you finish the show for us in style, Jenny. Let me give you the final score, because Jenny got a number of points then. So she's finished up in third place, equal with Stephen Frost, who haven't played as much as others. Uh, Peter Jones has played quite a lot. In fact, a hell of a lot. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but he's, he's always as well. He finished in second place, only just three points behind our leader, Tim Rice. So, Tim, we say you're the winner this week. <laughs> It only remains for me to say thank you and congratulations to these four delightful players of the game, Tim Rice, Peter Jones, Jenny Eclair and Stephen Frost. And from them and Elaine Wigley, who's kept the score so well for me, as well as blowing her whistle and so charmingly. And we also thank Ian Messiter, who thought of the game, which we all enjoy playing so much. We thank our producer, and that is Chris Neal. From our four panellists, from Elaine Wigley, from myself, Nicholas Parsons and everybody here in Brighton. Thank you for tuning in and tune in again the next time we take the air and we play just a minute until then goodbye <laughs>
Thank you, thank you. Hello, my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away, once more it is my pleasure to welcome the all the many, many listeners we have throughout the world, I can tell you, and also to welcome the four exciting, talented, and individual players of Just a Minute who have joined us for this particular edition of the show. We are delighted to welcome back an individual, an outstanding comedian, Paul Merton, and also a lovable and outrageous comedian, Graham Norton, and the, a talented and distinctively Scottish comedian, Richard Morton, and the distinctive <laughs> and multifaceted humorist, Clement Freud. Would you please welcome all four of them? <laughs> As usual, I am going to give them a subject on which I'm going to ask them to speak, and they will try and do that for just a minute if they can, but they have to do it without hesitation, repetition, or deviating from the subject. Beside me sits Elaine Wigley, who will help me keep the score, she'll hold the stopwatch, and she will blow a whistle when 60 seconds are up. And this particular edition of Just a Minute is coming from the Pleasance on the Fringe at the Edinburgh Festival, and in front of us here we have a delightful, attractive, and exuberant... <laughs> fringe audience who are going to encourage us on our way and we'll begin the show with Clement Freud. Clement, the subject is a can of worms. Can you tell us something about that subject in just a minute, starting now? A can of worms is a gastronomic item which has to date escaped me. I wonder whether lugworms really shouldn't get a much better press than they do. Um, worms in common with head lice, dung beetles, <laughs> and cockroaches are allowed... <laughs> <laughs> Paul Merton, you've challenged. Hesitation. I agree with the hesitation. So, Paul, you, uh, you have a correct challenge, you get a point for that, and you take over the subject of a can of worms, and there are 39 seconds left, starting now. I had to take back a tin of baked beans at a supermarket the other day, because it was well past its sell-by day. I opened it up, and there was a load of maggots inside it. I said, this is a can of worms you're selling me here. They said, well, what do you expect? There's more meat in it than you'd normally get. I said, listen here, I'm going to start a fight. So I did, and I took them to court, and I won. Several years after that, <laughs> I found myself walking through the district of Paisley, which is a as you know, is near Glasgow, and I was wandering around when suddenly a man came out the shadows holding a can of worms. He gesticulated to me in a rather strange manner, and I was tempted to follow him down these labyrinths, these dark alleyways, into a very strange area where I suddenly saw the worms burial ground. <laughs> well done. Well, Paul Merton not only took the subject, but took it at pace and kept going and kept changing the phraseology so he didn't repeat himself. And uh, speaking as the whistle went, so he gains an extra point for that. And at the end of that round, you won't be surprised to hear that he's the only one who's got any points. <laughs> and Paul, we'd like you to take the next round. The subject, black comedy. Tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now. It's a particular form of humour, black comedy, that looks at the darker side of life. One prime example of this would be the Mel Brooks film Young Frankenstein, made in the early 1970s, that featured the monster recreated by the Mad Doctor. And there was a rather charming graveyard sequence, I seem to remember, that was rather fun. Marty Feldman... Richard Morton, you've challenged. Repetition. What? <laughs> Sir, I'm actually from Newcastle, Nicholas, but you said I was Scottish, so I had to go, repetition. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so, if it's so, all right, so Richard, have I got to um, actually introduce the whole show again? No, no, no. no, 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 no Richard's no. prepared to come from Scotland yeah. for the purposes yeah. of this show. <laughs> yeah. if, you want, if you want to move the border down to the Roman Wall, that's OK, I don't mind, it's great. And sorry about that Swedish accent, everybody, I put on there. But uh, Paul actually repeated the word rather. He did, did. He did. rather yes. did it twice. Yeah. Really? You know what it is. Yes. That's not like me. Yeah. No, 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 but it was correct. So, uh, Richard Morton, <laughs> you have a correct challenge, and uh, it's lovely to have somebody from Newcastle on the show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we're lovely to have black comedy as a subject, by the way, and you have a correct challenge, a point for that. 38 seconds available starting now. Black comedy, of course, is very big in Scotland, with many comedians like Chip Murray from Glasgow coming out with marvellous, macabre, dark sort of jokes, putting them into his stand-up act and making them very successful. Scottish audiences, of course, like dark comedy. Indeed. Clement Floyd challenge. Repetition of, of course. Oh, yes. Oh. <laughs> yes, 
let's get one of those sort of reactions. Ooh. Well, if it's going to be like yeah. that. <laughs> get him. But it is a correct challenge, and when the rules are game, I have to abide by that. So, Clement, you have a, a point for that. You have 24 seconds still available on black comedy starting now. I like Bill Cosby best. <laughs> Format you challenged. Uh, hesitation. Yes, actually. <laughs> yes, I, I think you would interpret that as hesitation. I think it was uh, just about that. So, another point to you, Paul. Black comedy, 19 seconds available, starting now. There is a production that tours around the country called the Rocky Horror Picture Show. And our chairman, Nicholas Parsons, was once desperate enough to appear in it <laughs> in a pair of fishnet stockings where he would parade around on stage in front of people who paid good money to see <laughs> And he would regale them with what he liked to think was his wind thing. <laughs> we have some Rocky Horror fans in the audience, actually. Well, it's there a we black are. comedy, isn't it? We, and a black comedy, there we are. Uh, with black tights and black fishnet tights and high heel shoes, but that's only for the finale. Uh, <laughs> that's what he wears going to the theatre. <laughs> Paul, you kept going. With your description of black comedy or Nicholas Parsons in his high heel shoes, until the whistle went, so you have gained that extra point. And pros and cons. That's the subject, Richard. Go on it if you can for 60 seconds, starting now. Pros and cons, of course, uh, means the good or the bad, the easy or the difficult. It's a judgment or a decision that we make and decide in a contingency way in our minds. When we are faced with a situation that is so difficult, we just talk rubbish like I'm doing now. <laughs> Hopefully someone will take pity on me and both. And Cla that. Graham Norton. It, it was just a mercy interruption. Yeah. <laughs> it, right. It's sort of the panel game equivalent of Pet Rescue. Yeah. I just came in. <laughs> Uh, Graham, uh, Norton, yes. 43 seconds available to tell us something about pros and cons starting now. Pros and cons are similar yet different. Pros make you pay for something you want. Cons <laughs> remove money from you for things you don't actually need. Con men. You see, rather clever. I don't know how I thought of it myself. <laughs> However, that's really the end of the only thing I can think of to say about that. Pro oh, uh, Clement Freud challenge. Well, that's it, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> You've had a similar challenge to the other one for, that Graham had for Richard. So 18 seconds for you, Clement, on pros and cons starting now. People believe that some of the most beautiful prose was written by Ed Nelson <laughs> Vincent Millay, although Catherine Mansfield has her admirers. Moving smoothly to cons, these tend to be confidence tricksters, evil men. Emma <laughs> Freud was then speaking as the whistle went gained that extra point for doing so, and he's moved forward. He's still in second place behind Paul Merton, our leader. Graham Norton, it's not only your turn to begin. Oh, I'm sure this has been chosen for you. Fashion victim. <laughs> Is that a thing already? No, Marvelous. I could say to our listeners that, that Graham is probably looking the most elegant and most fashion conscious dresser of anybody can on I, this Can particular... I just say, coming from you, Nicholas, that's very scary. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere there's a deck chair with a coat shaped hole in it. <laughs> that's because I'm wearing a sporty, stripy blazer. <laughs> which is modelled by Anthony Eden. <laughs> <laughs> which I, I'm not able to wear on television because it's what is known as strobes. It all goes like that. That's what they told you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Graham, he's wearing an outrageous check shirt with a sort of suede-type jacket with a pocket. I don't know whether he is a fashion victim or not, but he will talk on the subject for 60 seconds if he can, starting now. I'm put in mind of Zandra Rhodes, poor sad creature. She technically is not a fashion victim, more a fashion fatality. She is the catwalk equivalent of a roadkill. The squashed hedgehog of haute couture. Some spiky, bloody mess on the street would be more attractive than one of the bizarre caftan-esque things that she puts over her head in the morning. Does she not have a full-length mirror in her house? <laughs> 
for the strange doodling she places upon her very own head. I can't understand it at all. You do sort of think it's crueler to test that on her than an animal. <laughs> Well, Graham, you have not played the game as much as others, but, my goodness me, you have got the knack of it now. You went with style and panache and verve, and you kept going for the full 60 seconds. You didn't repeat yourself, you didn't hesitate, and you did not deviate. And at the end of 60 seconds, you gained that extra point for speaking, but you get a bonus point for not being interrupted. Congratulations again. Clement, your turn to begin. The subject, the full shilling. Tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now. The English shilling is a rather outmoded piece of currency, but the full shilling was worth 12 pence, or 24 halfpennies, or twice that number of farthings. <laughs> there was something called the Queen's shilling, which many thought was the going price for a homosexual relationship, <laughs> but is actually money which recruiting officers gave young men in order to fight in the army for... Paul McGallan! Well, he said he was the, the joint the Navy, therefore it was a homosexual practice. <laughs> it's <laughs> deviation. <laughs> he said, we all know what they get up to in the Navy. Yeah, no, 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 the challenge yeah. was... Uh, oh, God. <laughs> oh, it's it all on. on tape, just <laughs> fall it back. <laughs> It doesn't matter, it doesn't It doesn't really matter. matter. It would take too long to explain. It took too long to explain. <laughs> so, an incorrect challenge, then, we'll say. Was, uh, and, Clement, you continue for 28 seconds, uh, for the full shilling starting now. There used to be a woman called Mrs Shilling, who was a milliner and wore... Paul Charles. Deviation, she's still alive. <laughs> Gertrude far... Shilling. Gertrude her Shilling, mother. yes. Mm -hmm. She's still alive. Her mother? Yes. Well, her mother... <laughs> <laughs> Her mother's still alive, and her grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> Never die these shows. Yes. Uh, actually, he wasn't strictly deviating from yes, that. He was. just said, no, you... <laughs> <laughs> just when I defend you for once, Clement, mm. I was all right. You were, yes. yes. Gertrude, you, you didn't actually say Gertrude Schilling. No. Nope. No, you just said Mrs Schilling. And the many Mrs Schillings in this world, and I'm sure many of them are alive and kicking, probably listen to this programme. <laughs> Paul, you have got the subject at last. Oh. 23 seconds available. The full shilling starting now. I wonder if it's one of those phrases like, he's not the full shilling, it's a sandwich short of a picnic, the lights are on but there's nobody at home. It's that kind of colloquialism which we use about people who aren't all there. When I look around at this marvellous audience <laughs> in front of me, I can see several candidates for people who aren't the full shilling. For example, there's a man at the back there, he's looking very oddly. <laughs> So, Paul Merton once again kept going to the whistle when gained that extra point for doing so and has increased his lead at the end of the round. And, Paul, it's your turn to begin. And the subject is déjà vu. Will you tell us something about déjà vu in just a minute, starting now? Well, I'm sure I've had this subject before. <laughs> As I was saying... The experience of déjà vu, you may be sitting reading a book when suddenly an image comes into your head of being in that same position with a piece of paper in your hand with typed words on it. You think, I have done this before. I have lived a life before. <laughs> <laughs> Graham Norton, you challenge first. Oh, in <laughs> fairness, it was repetition, really. Yes, yes, it was. Right. Graham, there are 33 seconds left. Deja Vu is with you, starting now. I recall watching an American film, very frightening, scared me, and it contained a teenage girl. And after one of her friends was killed in a similar way than all the other people she knew in the college, she screamed, oh! No, it's like deja vu all over again. <laughs> and, oh, thank God. <laughs> Richard Morton, new challenge. I just couldn't get to the end. It was scaring the life out of me. <laughs> right. I think it was repetition, though. We had a little breath there. Was a little tiny breath there? A, a, a breath is, is hesitation, actually. Well, I'd breathe I mean, twice. Yes, hesitation, that was the word. Just, yeah. just when you're going to get to the denouement, just as the knife was coming down there, Graham. Yes, I, I live I, in stage of you can't help but have repetition. Yeah. 
but he hesitated. But he, but he hesitated. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. He hesitated. Oh, oh I do beg but your pardon. But he part. got muddled between hesitation and repetition. Yeah. Ah. He hasn't played the game no. as much as oh, you. Oh, I see. And I'm he from is. Scotland, you know. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Can't you tell by my accent, Paul? Absolutely. All <laughs> yeah, right. So, uh, the... <laughs> Didn't the first sound very time cider who's been, been adopted by the Scots. Okay. Um, seven seconds are available for you, Richard, on Deja Vu, starting now. I've always wondered what, indeed, the French use for the term Deja Vu. Because <laughs> if that's their phrase for it, then what do they... Clement Freud. I just thought it would be nice to press this buzzer. <laughs> <laughs> Was it? <laughs> well, no. 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 <laughs> Disappointing. Disappointing. <laughs> So, Richard, you have a point for an incorrect challenge. You keep the subject. There is half a second left. Deja vu starting now. Quel dommage. <laughs> so, Richard Morton gained that extra point for speaking as the whistle went, and he has moved forward, and he is in second place now behind Paul Merton. Clement Freud, it's your turn to begin. The subject is gear. Tell us something about gear starting now. <laughs> gear is a Hebridean island which is just... <laughs> west of the Mull of Kintar, you would overfly Aaron and on the way to Isla, possibly Colonsay, there is Gear, spelled G-I and then the first letter again, H-A. <laughs> it's a particularly pleasant landmass and I would recommend that everyone go there and the place is about the same size as this audience so that you would be extraordinarily welcome. <laughs> I haven't myself been there but <laughs> noticed it on the map. Here is also a word used for clothing, apparel, the sort of trousers, shirts, shoes, socks, ties that predominantly young people now wear on all occasions say look at my gear and one regards, one does as asked and I find it really pretty appalling, I mean sad, the sort of designer Well, it is very rarely that we have somebody who starts the subject and finishes it without being interrupted, and it's happened twice in the show already, and uh, kept going to the whistle when again that extra point for doing so, and a bonus point for not being interrupted, and he's now gone into the lead just ahead of Paul Merton. And, Paul, it's your turn to begin. The subject is the endurance test. You have 60 seconds, as usual, starting now. If you were an ordinary punter up here at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival and you decided to see ten shows a day for every single 24 hours of the particular thing that's going on up here, you would need to have the stamina of a workhorse because there are over 500 shows, there are thousands of performers, there are 14 pints of beer to drink every hour. It's extraordinary the amount of effort and work you'd go to just to be uh, Graham Norton challenge. It seems quite, it was repetition of hour. Yes, there was. There yeah. are hour and shows as well. Oh, well, but... so I'm going home. <laughs> <laughs> Graham, you have. It wasn't worth it. Don't laugh, please. Um, you have 34 seconds to tell us something about the endurance test starting now. The endurance test that enters most of our lives most frequently is. Clement Freud. Repetition of most. There were two mosts. Most frequently, who, most of our lives. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> Clement, 28 seconds, tell us something about the endurance test starting now. The very first gramophone record which I ever had and went to school with was called There's No One With Endurance But The Man Who Sells Insurance. <laughs> He's everybody's best friend. You may follow him and get him, but remember, he will bet him, for he gets us all in the end. Nobody much listened to it, so he never <laughs> became one of the discs in the top ten, because in those halcyon days of my youth, there was no such thermometer of success. Well, Clement Freud's illustrating his success of playing this game because he kept going to the whistle wing, gained that extra point and has increased his lead at the end of the round. Richard Morton, will you take the next round? My favourite figurine. Can you tell us something about it <laughs> in just a minute, starting now? My favourite figurine is a small plastic figure of Top Cat. 
the Hanna-Barbera cartoon character, uh, which I bought in New York about five years ago in FAO Schwartz, the toy shop, and uh, it reminds me of happy childhood memories sitting in front of the television watching what I now consider to be a very sophisticated and witty animated TV series from the late 50s and early 60s. Uh, Graham Norton, who challenged? Oh, repetition of TV. Did yeah, I? Yes, I'm did afraid I? so. Yes, you did. This is harder than it looks, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Graham, a correct challenge. My favourite figurine is with you. There are 39 seconds available starting now. My favourite figurine was entitled <laughs> The Balloon Lady and belonged to my grandmother, whose name, bizarrely and truly, was Nellie Graham. I kid you not. <laughs> the figurine sat on her sideboard and was dusted regularly. God love her, because she knew that a tidy home is a happy place you live in. <laughs> and the, the, the figurine thing. Uh, <laughs> Richard Morton, you've challenged. Yeah, that was hesitation, but Graham, I never knew your grandmum had sideboards. What, did she have like <laughs> You've got, a, you've got your grandmother's sideboards. The figurines in them. Yeah. Lovely. Richard, you have 11 seconds to tell us more about my favourite figurine starting now. Whereas in the late 70s and early 80s, a lot of the cartoons I felt had lost that early sophistication and wittiness that had... Um, oh, I said that before. You can make me go away. <laughs> Paul Merton, You said it before and I'm not going to let him get away with it. Uh, no. <laughs> I said that before, and you've got no yeah. A correct Deja vu. That was your one. Deja vu. Three seconds, my favourite figurine, Paul, starting now. And Nathan Lee, don't do it, please. Um, Let me have a winning one. Let me Richard, win. What's your challenge? Uh, just that I wanted to win that one, and Paul was going to get it. <laughs> no, you're right. I'm being no, silly. No, no, I'm afraid you, you, uh, you, because you challenged, it's an incorrect one. Paul gets another point. Oh, you. Mm. Yes. <laughs> you've got your own show. What more do you want? <laughs> I want love. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good, but let me win this one thing. All this audience here are giving you so much. Look at their faces. <laughs> Exuding love towards you, Paul. And, um... Do it in Top Cat's voice and I'll let you have the points. Go on. Oh, you let me have the points. <laughs> they can't realize... see where my hands are right now, can they? I didn't realise we had a trainee Nicholas Parsons in our midst. Oh, did you know Paul? about... Did yeah. you know that, Nicholas? No, I did not know that. No, no, no. I'm not wearing that jacket. I <laughs> There's a chance that you could be superseded. Yeah. He's yeah. Scottish, you know. Yes, yes. <laughs> you often hear you hear the word super and Nicholas Parsons in the same sentence. <laughs> yeah. I know. I wish I'd never started this, I'm sorry. Oh, right, right. We, we seed on and uh, there are two seconds available. That's all, Paul, for my favourite figurine starting now. Picture the scene. You've got a lovely mantelpiece in your living room. So, Paul Merton gained points in that round, including one for speaking as a whistle went. He's now only one behind our leader, who is still Clement Freud. And then trailing a little behind is Graham Norton and Richard Morton. Together, we're moving into the final round. It's a pity about that. We're very sad. I'm sure the audience is sad. Yes. But there we are. All good things must come to an end, mustn't they? <laughs> and it's, uh, it's Graham Norton's turn to begin, which is always nice to hear from Graham. So, Graham, bring the show to a wonderful, rousing finish with a great subject. Oh, yes, idea for you. It's Shindig. Tell us something about it in this game, starting now. The Shindig was a special archaeological excavation performed by archaeologists who had lost their arms in a terrible accident involving the historic flint. They would tie little shovels just above the knee and kneel on the ground, grunting furiously. When they found a particularly rare piece of pottery, unable to clap their hands, they would slap their thighs together with joy. You would hear the p or the feels if you were driving along that part of the country. Oh, people would say. That would be the... Uh, Clement Freud challenge. Repetition of people. Yes, yeah, so a lot of people about you. Yeah. <laughs> you may breathe. I no, mean, no, please. Thank God. <laughs> The shindig, yes, what a lovely interpretation. Clement! <laughs> there are 19 seconds for you on the shindig starting now. Shindig is a sort of Irish Cayley, what you might call a soiree with a binge on top, <laughs> in which an awful lot of people drink and dance and clap their hands, whether or not joy is there, and make contact generally... I think I've said <laughs> Actually, 
Richard, you challenged with only half a second to go. What was your challenge? Did I? Yes. Well, Clement actually told you what he did. Yeah. Well, what... <laughs> I was just trying to get back in the game. No, he said he'd repeated something. And I wanted to hear that phrase again, soiree with a binge on top. Oh, I see. That he did great. actually repeat something, so you yeah. have half a second to go on Shindig starting now. <laughs> oh, no, someone else had done it. Paul. Hesitation. Yes, right, Paul. <laughs> Hold a second, my Paul. My mouth is ready, I had sh. Paul, sort a second, starting now. My face. Ah, oh, yes. <laughs> right. So, we have no more time to play, just a minute. For those interested in the points, let me give you the final situation. Um, Graham Norton, in spite of going for nearly two rounds without being attractive, but it's the contribution he makes which is so wonderful. He didn't get many points. No. Great contribution. <laughs> Richard Morton, a similar situation, lovely contribution, <laughs> fewer points. <laughs> and Paul Merton, great contribution. Clement Freud, magnificent contribution. And with that little bit of flutter I did at the end, brought Paul up equal with Clement Freud, so very justifiably, and I think very fairly, equal winners, Clement Freud and Paul Merton. Thank you to our four exciting players of the game, Paul Merton, Graham Norton, Richard Morton and Clement Freud. I also have to thank uh, Elaine Wigley for blowing her whistle so charmingly and also helping me keep the score. Uh, we thank Ian Messiter who created this game and keeps us all happy as we enjoy playing it so much. And of course Chris Neal, our producer and director, who keeps us all in order, makes sure it all comes together magnificently at the end. And we thank this wonderful audience here who've come to encourage us here at the Pleasance on the Fringe at the Festival of Edinburgh. Thank you so much. You've been lovely. From the audience, from our four panellists, from me, Nicholas Parsons, to our listeners, thank you for tuning in. Be with us the next time we play Just a Minute. Till then, from all of us here, goodbye. <laughs> Welcome to Just a Minute. <laughs> Hello, my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away, once more it is my pleasure not only to welcome our many listeners, but also the four exciting, individual and humorous talents who this week are going to pit their wits and display their verbal dexterity as they play Just a Minute. We welcome that flamboyant and extrovert comedian and actor Tony Slattery, the stand-up comedian and all-round performer Stephen Frost, the actor and theatre producer Derek Nimmo, and the restaurateur, politician, writer, racehorse owner, you name it, he's done it, Clement Freud. Would you please welcome all four of them? <laughs> And as usual, I am going to ask them to speak on a subject that I will give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviation. Beside me sits Anne Osborne, who's going to help me keep a score. She's going to hold the stopwatch, and she'll blow a whistle when the 60 seconds are up. And this particular edition of Just a Minute is coming from the St. James Concert Hall in the delightful and lovely island of Guernsey. And uh, we're going to begin the show this week, who better, yes, Tony Slattery. Tony, will you go on the subject of the gate crasher, starting now? Well, interesting enough for those listening at home, there are, in fact, in this concert hall, 350 gate crashers. <laughs> because none of them... <laughs> so Clement Freud challenge almost immediately, yes. And we can recognise the hesitation. Clement, you get a point for a correct challenge. You take over the subject. It's the gate crasher, and there are 51 seconds starting now. Technically, I suppose a gate crash is someone who goes to a party to which he or she has not been invited. My advice to one of those people, should there be a... Tony Slattery, you got back in again. Yes, it was. You got back in again. You have 40 seconds to continue, starting now. You've just reminded me, one of the most literal pieces of gate crashing I ever did was on my first driving test. I happened to fail it because when the chap said, when I hit the dashboard, you have to do an emergency stop, I put it into reverse and drove into someone's garden. This, and this is absolutely true, and I in fact failed the test. And what's more... Uh, Derek Nimmo, 
challenge. No test. You Two were tests. doing the test. They yes. Were. So a correct challenge from you, Derek. You get a point, of course, for that. There are 22 seconds still available. The subject is the gate crasher. If you're going to a society party which you're attempting to gate crash, I would advise you to go dressed, if you're a man, as a major in the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders. <laughs> Nobody will ever question your apparel. You'll be welcomed in, sat down, given a glass of champagne or maybe something even strong, perhaps a whiskey and soda, if that is the kind of tipple that you like. I did actually witness in Colombo last week. In this game, whoever is speaking as the whistle goes gains an extra point. On this occasion, it was Derek Nimmo. Derek, it's Nibbles. Tell us something about nibbles in this game, starting now. I myself have never been a great nibbler. My wife, in fact, likes nibbles, and she has them strategically around the house. You'll go into one room, there'll be a bowl with some nuts within it. Perhaps another has crisps or even chips, and perhaps somewhere else there'll be... Uh, Stephen like Frost perhaps. challenge. Two, yeah, two perhaps. There were two yeah, perhaps, yes. yes, yes. Right. Well, well, on the this. theme able to keep going. Stephen, 44 seconds are available. You have a point for a correct challenge. Nibbles is with you, starting now. Last week, my pet cat died. It was called Nibbles. <laughs> and of course, the whole family was very sad. It was my fault. I didn't think the microwave would kill it. <laughs> but it was the only way to dry it after washing it. Nibbles was the family favourite. He used to come up to us when we were cooking and sit on the salad board and rub its bottom up and down. <laughs> making the food very unhealthy, but we loved that cat. <laughs> Clement Freud challenged you after that disgusting remark you made, and you've... Uh, Clement, what was your challenge? Repetition of ha. Of ha? <laughs> ha, ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't think that was a correct challenge, Stephen. So you uh, have a point for an incorrect challenge. You have 21 seconds available for you on Nibbles starting now. Of course, we brought a new one and oh. named it Nibbles too. Clement, to sort of challenge. Repetition, of course. Clement, 20 seconds available for you on Nibbles starting now. Nibbles are an excellent thing to take a party that you're gate trashing. Bring a bowl of nibbles and nobody will stop you at the door and say, have you been invited? Chips, crisps, nuts, pretzels... Whatever there is in the container with nibbles will give you free entry to the... And Derek got in... Repetition of entry. Yes, you did mention entry before. And you... Oh, there's two seconds left, Derek. So, nibbles, two seconds. I really love having my ear <clears throat> right, at the end of that round, uh, Derek Nimmo, speaking of the win, got the extra point. He's equal to Clement Freud in the lead. Stephen Frost and Tony Slattery follow in that order. And, Stephen, we'd like you to take the next round. Barcode. Tell us something about it in this game, starting now. Next time you go shopping to the supermarket, take a black felt-tip pen with you. And when you pick up the products you wish to purchase, put a line down the barcode and you'll find you'll get it much cheaper than originally priced. <laughs> I've been doing this for years and getting away with it, mostly with my cat food for Nibbles, who I no longer have, of course. But when I first bought that feline... Uh, Tony, you challenge. A little hesitation. Ah, uh, yes, uh, definitely. 39 seconds, Tony. Another point to you, and barcodes with you, starting now. If, like me and Nicholas, you frequent singles bars... <laughs> I've often thought the best way to break the ice with strangers is to have a certain barcode, by which I mean you wear badges on which you put your favourite topic of conversation. For instance, with the aforesaid chairman, it would be alcoholism. With me, it might be gingham frocks. The point is that if you have a... Uh, Stephen Frost, you challenge. Gingham frocks, deviation. <laughs> <laughs> So, 15 seconds with you, Stephen. Barcode starting now. If you cut out the barcodes from all packets of cornflakes or any type of cereal in the supermarket and stack them end to end, you'll. <laughs> oh, what? End to end. Oh, it's an impossible game, yes. So many phrases are repetitious. And Clement, you got in first. You got a point for that, of course. And barcodes back with you. Six seconds starting now. One of the most interesting things about barcodes is... Stephen... Uh, the Asian barcodes aren't interesting. <laughs> well, perhaps they are to Clement. I've got to be fair within the rules. Yeah, they would be to Clement. Yeah, yes. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, not, strictly speaking. Deviating within the rules of just a minute, so it's still with you, Clement. Three seconds, barcode, starting now. When evening comes, I never tire. 
Clement got that extra point at the end of the round. He's also taken the lead, and he begins the next round. Clement, the information highway, that is the subject. Tell us something about it in uh, just a minute, starting now. I'm not tremendously conversant with the information highway, but for the record, if you want to email me, the number is fr. Dot point slash barcode UK. No comment. I have a typewriter which is not going to survive the millennium because one of the ratchets has dropped off. Uh, uh, <laughs> a strange thing happened. Clement, you actually challenged yourself then. Hesitation. Hesitation, yes. 33 seconds, starting now. If you drive up the motorway, you will find all sorts of information on that highway. Turn left, no stopping, kill, RAC... Stephen, what is... Kill? Kill? <laughs> yes, you're Just kill? Speed kill. Just get out your car and shoot somebody. <laughs> Just west, west of Dublin. <laughs> west? Kill? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. No, it's a, it's a town. It's a town. Oh, uh, but oh, it's not on the it's not on the hi- not on the motorway. The highway. Oh, highway, yeah. highway. On the highway. All right. Oh, yeah. So sure clever, Clement. Oh, so Clement. Around. Yes, you justified it, Clement. Right. Another point to you. Twenty-four <laughs> seconds. The information highway is starting now. No information. Uh, Derek, challenge first. Well, it hasn't got any information. So. Is right. Twenty-three seconds. The information highway, Derek, starting now. I must say it has changed my life considerably because I put on plays in places like, say, Jakarta, and if I want to send a poster down the line full of the design and colour, I do use the information highway. And somehow or other, why it works, I have no idea. Sitting on a desk in Indonesia, out it pops, and they can then print the artwork from it. It is an absolute miracle. I can't. Mm. Derry was speaking as a whistle when gained that extra point for doing so he's moved forward but he's still trailing our leader Clement Freud Tony it's your turn to begin the thousand and one nights <laughs> <laughs> tell us something about them in just a minute starting now Like the Song of Solomon, The Thousand and One Nights is a hymn to physical love. Euterpe and agape are the classical terms therein. In The Thousand and One Nights, many positions are tried. And even when boredom sets in, Nicholas, I'm looking at you here, the main thing is that invention, physical passion, floods the scene and everyone is alight with the joys of rubbing up against each other. I'm talking about nibbles now, the cat. (laughs) Yes, anything goes. There are no rules in this world of a thousand and one nights. The Arabic term for a thousand and one nights is a thousand and one nights. (laughs) That's because in... in, Oh... (laughs) Tony, that's the longest anybody's gone for a while. We went for 46 seconds. Oh, well, well done. But unfortunately, you stumbled there. Clement Freud got in first. 14 seconds with you, uh, Clement. The, the Thousand and One Nights starting now. A Thousand and One Nights is a rather higher figure than you tend to get at investitures. Nevertheless, you go to Buckingham Palace, having been summoned by Her Majesty, who appears with a sword which she claps upon your shoulder, saying, Arise, Sir 987. (laughs) Clement Freud was speaking as a whistle and gained that all-important extra point to move him forward. And, Derek, we move to you now to begin the next round. The subject, Daddy Longlegs. Tell us something about it in this game, starting now. Daddy Longlegs is a book written by Jean Webster in about 1903, I think. It is a very charming book about a little girl who's an orphan. Uh, Stephen Frost. It's about, it's about like yes, and a book as well, right. Uh, uh, Stephen, you've got in with 51 seconds available. Daddy Longlegs, starting now. When I was at school, we used to catch them on the playing fields and pull their legs off one by one <laughs> and make them spin around... <laughs> You, you one by one, one by one. What's the matter with you? End to end. End to end, one by one. You're, you're, you're a great phraseology man, yeah. aren't you? End to end, one yeah, by one, one, one yes. yes. Yeah. 45 oh. seconds, back with you is the subject of Daddy Long Legs, Derek, starting now. One of the governors of the school noticed a particular girl and thought that she would benefit from a better education, so she was sent away to a college in a different part of America, and then she was told to write a letter once a week 
to this man called Smith. It wasn't his real name, but she wasn't allowed to what he would know what he was called, so she had to call him Daddy Longlegs, and that she did. And many years later, many letters, many, many, uh, many, 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 the best thing to do with these insects, if you catch them when they get on your nerves... Derek Challenge. Repetition of catch. You talked about catching them before, yeah. I'm afraid. Derek, <laughs> you got in first. 18 seconds, Daddy Longlegs starting now. The crane fly, which is the official name of the Daddy Longlegs. Right, Stephen Frost, you've challenged. What is your challenge? It was a bit of a slur and a hesitation. Well, I'm sure you're right, so yes. take the subject. <laughs> on one of the words. 14 seconds, Daddy Longlegs, Stephen starting now. When they fly into an easterly wind, they get mesmerised by the noise passing over their antennae. This has been scientifically proved by the famous Professor... Derek Challenge. I haven't got antennae. Uh, well, I might have a satellite dish or something. Yes. <laughs> so, Cables. sorry, Probably. correct challenge, deviation, four seconds. With you, Derek, starting now. Hello, Daddy Longlegs. Uh, uh, Tony Challenge. Wait, 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 you've been challenged by Tony Slattery. I'm sorry, I, was there deviation from the English language? I didn't understand the first word. <laughs> Oh! And deviation from Derek's normal delivery as well. So, Tony, you've got him with two seconds on Daddy Longlegs, starting now. Pull their legs off and they can make really good false eyelashes. <laughs> At the end of that round, uh, Clement Freud is still in the lead. And Stephen Frost, it is your turn to begin. <laughs> the subject... The human condition. Now, this own... could be a subject yes. really chosen for you, isn't right, it? Yeah, of Tell us something about the human condition in 60 seconds, starting now. Well, I was having a long discussion about the human condition with my friend Stephen Fry the other day. <laughs> and he said to me, if you go on that programme, just a minute, I'll tell you what to say. World, peace, war, what's it all about? Why do humans fight? Why do they make up and then start the argy-bargy again? This is part of the human condition. That's what he told me, and I've said it to you. And I think we can all... <coughs> Clement Freud challenge. It's repetition. Yes, but which one do you want? <laughs> <laughs> I have to know, because you might say something which he didn't repeat. Repetition of what Stephen Fry told him. <laughs> That is a clever challenge that gets you a bonus point, but you didn't actually challenge him for the sum of the words he repeated, so, Stephen, you still keep the subject. Oh, and you have 35 seconds to continue on the human condition starting now. In the great scheme of things, when whatever God is looking down upon us, they must think, why are these people doing what they do? And I can only reply, I don't know either. And this is part of the human condition, not knowing why we're here... <laughs> And uh, Derek, never challenge. There's no why. Yeah. There's a lot of whys there, yes. Yeah. Derek, 19 seconds. The human condition starting now. Two weeks ago, I was in Sri Lanka, and there'd been a terrible battle on the Jaffna Peninsula. And this is what I really mean by the human condition, how people can slaughter each other like that. 2,000 young men were killed, some tiger from Tamil and the others were ordinary soldiers. And as I was going to the airport, leaving the country, to all... <laughs> Well, on that rather sad note, Derek Nimmo brought that round to an close. Clement, it's your turn to begin. The subject, patois. Tell us something about that subject. <laughs> Starting now. An interesting French nursery rhyme goes, patois, patois, homme du boulanger, uh, fait moi un... Uh... <laughs> Tony I'm Chum. sorry, I think there was a little hesitation. There. Yeah, there was a definite uh, right. Tony, 52 seconds. Patois, starting now. One of my favourite jokes about South African patois is, of course I've got a grudge, where would I put my car? <laughs> that isn't, of course, the generally understood term uh, when you're talking about patois. For instance, cockney patois often sounds a bit like the language I was talking about earlier. For instance, hurry up with those fish and chips, I've got a train to catch. That's what people used to say. <laughs> <laughs> so the person yeah. laughing loudest at that last remark was Tony Slattery, the manager of Liberty. Sorry. I'm sorry. What is what is corpse due of your own? <laughs> oh. I thought you were going to go into your impersonations of the East Enders characters, which you do so well. Oh, thank you. I'll remember yeah. that for next time. Yes. <laughs> uh, Clement, you got in first. Twenty-two seconds. Patois, starting now. Batter cake, patois, baker's man. 
make me a cake as quick as you can was really what I was going to say on the subject of Patua. It's also a means of... Very no challenge. Um, hesitation. Hesitation, uh, yes. Uh, Nine seconds, Patois is with you, uh, um, Derek. Sutton. When I'm in southwest France, the Dordogne, when I have favourite things to eat is Patois de foie gras. It is absolutely <laughs> delicious. On the other hand, if you're travelling in the Cyclades. <laughs> Derek Nimmo got that extra point for speaking as the whistle went and our two most experienced players of the game. He and Clement Freud are now equal in the lead and Tony Snattery, your turn to begin and the subject here is tax haven. I can't imagine why that has come up in front of this particular audience but talk on the subject if you can, starting now. Well, of course, etymologically speaking, the word haven is a simple linguistic constriction of the word heaven. So I imagine a tax haven is a place where tax inspectors and VAT men sit around on fluffy clouds with long white beards playing harps and saying lovely things to you like, you owe me no money at all and here's a lovely little song. Another tax haven... Uh, Stephen Frost challenge. Two lovelies. There were two lovelies, oh, yes. Yes, so tax havens with you, Stephen Frost. Uh, 40 seconds, starting now. The best place to keep your money without paying tax is under your bed. Because have you ever seen a queue outside a mattress? I think you'll find that that is the easiest... Uh, Derek Nimmo challenge. Sorry, now, it was a great mistake. I thought he was going to pack up, but he suddenly came talking. I thought he, was <laughs> he had an agonised, constipated look on his face, and I thought he was going to stop, but he didn't. I apologise. That's not quite You get an extra point. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> That's the spirit of the game should be played. <laughs> 30 seconds. Stephen, on tax haven, with you starting now. Of course, none of us here need a tax haven because we don't get paid enough by the BBC for doing this. <laughs> uh, Clement Floyd Challenge. I'm sorry, but BBC is... Um... Oh, yes, BBC. <laughs> I'll take it down. Right, 26 seconds with you, Clement. Tax haven starting now. I would like... Tony to talk about East Enders a lot. Tony, you've challenged. I <laughs> was clever, you challenged and then pressed your buzzer. Um, so the tax havens with you back with you, Tony. And how many seconds? Twenty, starting now. Yes, a little known fact is that the East End of London is one of the most popular tax havens. It's where they all talk like this. I've got to get out of this bloody square. It's doing my head in. <laughs> Leave it. It's family. <laughs> uh, Tony. The audience think are applauding because they saw you pick up your buzzer and buzz yourself there. I think it was deviation from the subject. <laughs> right, Tony, you challenged yourself, you got a correct challenge, you. and you have eight seconds on Tax Haven starting now. Well, Guernsey is a tax haven in the way that... <coughs> Stephen Frost... I'm going to go for hesitation you there. Why? But, uh, you, you said it in and and in. Yeah, and yeah and I think there was a bit of hesitation. Yeah. You're very generous. <laughs> so, Stephen, five seconds on Tax Haven starting now. One of the best places that's known as a tax haven in this whole wild world, of course. Well, for those interested in points, Stephen Frost got a number in that round. He's moved forward, and in descending order, with only one point separating them all, it is Clement Floyd, Derek Nemo, Stephen Frost and Tony Slattery, so it's still very close. Derek, the next subject is buffer. We'd love you to take it and talk on it starting now. Sometimes a buffer state can be very useful to the country, which actually is the buffer. For instance, Thailand. It was never colonised or occupied because it stood between British, Burma, India and Malaya on one side and Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia, which were French, on the other. And that was greatly to their benefit. I myself am rapidly becoming a silly old buffer. Now, it's not something which I contemplated some years ago when I started doing this programme, but I find myself... I still stand up and let ladies sit uh, down. Uh, Stephen... Uh, to myself, sir. Uh, to, myself, yes. to myself, yes. 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 To myself, yeah. well, Stephen, yeah. you're doing well. Right, you've gone in there. 30 seconds on buffer, starting now. At the end of the railway line, you normally get two big buffers to stop the train going out of the station where it shouldn't. Because that's the terminal, you see, where they stop to let the passengers off. And if the buffer wasn't there, there would be an almighty accident, which we wouldn't want, would we? <laughs> so the buffer is in place to keep the train on the track, on the rails, on, 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 on. <laughs> Stephen, you may struggle, but they love the way you do it. And uh, Derek got in first. Uh, four seconds. Buffer with you, Derek, starting now. 
An old moustache, well worn. Uh, Clement Challenge. Sure. We've had old before. You've mentioned old. You said about you're an old buffer. You said before. Now you said old moustache. So Clement, you've got it with one second on buffer starting now. A wedding buffer is where. You... <laughs> Clement has now taken the lead, just ahead of Derek Nimmo and Stephen Frost, and then comes Tony Slattery and Stephen. Your turn to begin. The subject: a trip to the dentist. Tell us something about that painful experience for so many of us, starting now. The last time I made a trip to the dentist, he said to me, sit down and open wide, know your mouth. It got off on the wrong foot, but at least we got to know each other. (laughs) Rinse this out and I'll have a look. And he found, right at the back of my mouth, an ingrowing... What what are they called? (laughs) Toenail? (laughs) (laughs) Tony, you challenge. I think it was hesitation. I think it was hesitation, yes. 38 seconds. Tell us about a trip to the dentist starting now. Coincidentally, instead of dental floss to pick bits out between my teeth, I use Stephen's in growing toenails. <laughs> and they're very useful. Funnily enough, this is true. The last time I went to the dentist, I had an accident in that I had one of my wisdom teeth taken out and the dentist actually severed the lingual nerve, which means half of my tongue is numb and I keep biting it and my mouth keeps filling with blood. That's a nice little jolly tale, isn't it? And I just thought I'd share it with you. The anaesthetic they use at the dentist is something called lidocaine, which is not the same as the illegal drug cocaine, which, of course, is a controlled substance. No, the aforesaid pharmaceutical... Tony Slattery is showing off his university education with all that stuff about drugs and... uh... (laughs) I didn't mean it like that, actually. (laughs) Oh, I think I see the time. This could be, I think it will be, actually, the last round. So, it's still neck and neck for those interested in scores. Clement, it's your turn to begin, and the subject is showmanship. Tell us something about that subject in just a minute, starting now. I think a very good instance of showmanship is someone who was asked to speak for one minute on a trip to the dentist without hesitation, deviation or repetition and does it as well as does the gentleman sitting on my right, whose name, and I'm spinning this out a bit because (laughs) I have to go on for nearly a minute, is... Derek Nimmo's challenge. Repetition a minute. You mentioned a minute before. I'm sorry, Clement. So, Derek, you've got in there. 39 seconds available. Showmanship starting now. What the English theatre needs today are more showmen. There's not enough showmanship. Now, I wanted to ban... Uh, Clement Roy challenge. Grammatical deviation. Oh, what was the... the, 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 the... Um, what the English theatre need. <laughs> when it... <laughs> the English theatre really needs, I said. I think you said need, but it doesn't yes, really matter. Yeah, yeah. I think it was sort of colloquially. We all knew what he meant. Oh, is, is, it, the, is, is this a new rule now? <laughs> <laughs> i tell you what I'll do... Listen, I haven't done this for a long time, but I will put it to the superior wisdom and judgment of this delightful audience here in St. James's Concert Hall in Ghent. If you agree with Clement's challenge, you cheer for him, and if you disagree, you boo against him, and you all do it together now. Clement, they're with you. And they obviously noticed the grammatical error on Derek's part, so 21 seconds available for you, Clement, on showmanship, starting now. There is no business like showmanship. (laughs) It's a song which I have sung in many theatres all over the world, especially in Thailand, but also in Cambodia and Vietnam. (laughs) Exeter, Plymouth... Uh, Tony Slattery challenge. challenge. Um, hesitation, I think. And hesitation. Uh, yes, and I, I don't I think for a minute he stood up in theatres in Cambodia and Thailand singing, you know, there's no business like showmanship. <laughs> Tony got him with two seconds to go. The end of the last round, showmanship. Give us a bit of it, Tony, starting now. The hymn of showmanship is everything's coming up roses. As I said a friend ago, this was to be the last round, and indeed it is. So let me give you the final situation. Uh, Stephen Frost and Tony Slattery, who have not played the game quite as much as the other two, but they are so good at it, they finished equal in third place, very apt. But only two points behind Derek Nimmo 
And the equal number of times of playing the game is Clement Freud. This time, Clement Freud has just won by two points. You are the winner this week, Clement. So, it only remains for me to say thank you to our four delightful players of the game, Clement Floyd, Derek Nimmo, Stephen Frost and Tony Slattery, and I thank Anne Osborne for keeping the score for me and blowing her whistle so magnificently and with such style. We also thank the man who created this game, Ian Messiter, and also our producer, Chris Neal, who produces and directs the show with such efficiency. And to all our listeners who have tuned in, we hope you'll once more enjoy just a minute. Until then, from all of us, goodbye!